participate within this lecture series, and I wish to gratefully acknowledge Dr. Sam Thompson for the opportunity to be here. In addition, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Rob Armstrong, Dr. Michael Kent, Dr. Graham Purchase from the Mississippi State University for their kind um, donation of slides, which are going to be incorporated into this talk this afternoon. By way of introduction, what I'd like to do is focus a little bit on some of the conventional um, treat strategies that are currently employed within the aquaculture industry, just to give you an overview in terms of some of the current management and production schemes and how this relates to or predisposes fish to um, coming down with certain disease processes, and then focus on the clinical and pathological inflammatory responses that of representative diseases, just to give you some indication of how these relate to pathophysiology, as well as some of the current treatment and preventative measures which are currently employed within the aquaculture industry. From a um, pathologic perspective, I'm going to focus on septicemic disease processes, as well as ulcerative and erosive and granulomatous. One thing that I'd really like to emphasize is that these disease manifestations are not mutually exclusive. This is just a very artificial type of classification. It's not unusual for a fulminant disease course, such as a septicemic episode, to progress on to a granulomatous disease entity. Just by way of introduction, what I would like to emphasize is that as veterinarians and veterinary students aspiring to go into the aquaculture industry, our training within traditional domesticated species is very broad and basic. And the processes in terms of trying to understand disease epidemiology within a farm where you bring in cattle from ranges into feedlot situations where you decrease the distance of disease transmission, you increase the frequency of contact. There are certain stressors that are normally associated with overcrowding. You have a accumulation of nitrogenous waste. Well, these same principles, whether you apply them to range lot fit situations or range hens that are brought into, into intensive um, colony type situations, well, those are the same type of principles that we're going to see within the uh, fish diseases, where you bring in fish from rivers or streams. And in this photograph of uh, the Mississippi catfish industry, where you have large pond-like situations, well, the principles that underlie our domesticated species are the same ones that we can apply as veterinarians to what's going on in the aquaculture industry. This is just a photograph of a uh, sea-based system in our arm-growing facility off the west coast of Canada. Similarly, this is just another angle or a different perspective to show you this cage-type culture situation. In addition to that, we have facilities such as this one in Northern California, Moccasin Creek, ha Creek Hatchery, where they use this form of facility, a raceway-type design, is used to mimic the natural ecological niche of these fish within the environment. And here we have rainbow trout, and then water would be streaming down this raceway-type facility. In addition, I'll also touch on some of the aquarium fish diseases. And this poses some very interesting management and husbandry type problems that are being addressed with increasing interest be um, between different national facilities as well as the tropical fish hobbyists. This, I also want to emphasize that within these facilities you have a very broad biodiversity and it's really a feat to try and accommodate all and each of the different biological demands if, that these species require. This is just a graph to illustrate the different diversity of species that are currently being reared within the United States and to emphasize that within the catfish industry, on a per tonnage yield, this far exceeds all other species, virtually all of them combined. Interestingly enough, just within the last year or two, the Atlantic main Atlantic salmon fisheries has just exceeded the total cash crop yield and surpassed that of the catfish industry, which for the last 10 to 15 years has surpassed virtually all forms of aquaculture. Interestingly enough, we also have to emphasize that there are invertebrates as well as tropical fish and um, cold water species that are currently being reared. The first group of fish I'd like to address are the catfish. Most of the industry is situated within California, Texas, Alabama, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, which accounts between 65 to 75 percent of the t total tonnage yield, as well as Florida. This graph is somewhat dated in that the industry itself has started to expand northward, northward into Indiana, Missouri, and South Carolina. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong button. Just to in indicate how popular this industry is, from a historical perspective, the catfish industry within Mississippi started about 25 years ago where some enterprising um, producers of tr more traditional uh, crop yields such as soybean and cotton had elected to use or tr um, try and develop alternative forms of farming 
and they thought that the catfish would actually be a quite a successful species. Part of the reason why Mississippi has been so successful is the nature of the geology of the area. Here they have fairly uh, large amounts of clay within the sand, within the soil, which is capable of retaining these large bodies of water which are used to rear the fish. In other areas where you have increased number amounts of bedrock fissure or sand, you'd have persistent seepage and the cost of replenishing this water on an ongoing basis would be prohibitively expensive. These ponds are constructed initially by using a grading type situation where soil is moved from the center of the pond and essentially dispersed along the lateral margins to form the levees. These ponds vary anywhere in depth between six feet to four feet in size. These tend to be the optimal depth and size. Historically, they've had anywhere up to 20 acres in production, but now it's found that over time, selection has been to between five and seven acres appears to be the optimal size in terms of maximizing the overall performance of the stock within given ponds. I should also mention, from, um, just for background, is that a lot of these areas had been historically used to rear cotton and um, soybean and so on, and they have had fairly extensive use of insecticides and pesticides, and before any of these farms construction starts, they typically test for pesticide residues, and unless they can prove any residues, then they will not proceed. There's a wellhead that's installed, and water is pumped in to the facility, and then maintained, and typically these farmers will maintain ponds for anywhere up to 10 years before they're drained, cleaned, and then um, any sort of repair needed along the levees themselves. One thing that's important to emphasize as well is that these producers will typically have uh, multiple year stocks within each pond. And what I'd like to do now is just carry you through the overall production or life cycle of channel catfish starting from the egg stage right through to the eventual harvest processing and marketing. And then I'll go in and do the same thing for the salmon. And then more briefly, just cover an overview of some of the aquarium design and exhibits that are currently being used within some of the national facilities as well as within um, some of the tropical fish hobbyists. One thing of note is that, as I had mentioned before, that about between five and six acres seems to be the optimal size in terms of overall performance. Increasingly, some producers are moving towards some of these smaller ponds, which are anywhere between a quarter acre to, to an eighth of an acre in size, where they can be more intentionally ma intensively managed, increased aeration and surveillance. The overall yield per acre far exceeds that of some of the larger ponds, although the initial capital expenditure is significantly greater. It's found that moving into more smaller ponds will eventually be the, na the natural course of the industry in terms of trying to intensify and uh, becoming more streamlined. I should also mention that there have been attempts to try and rear catfish within large concrete vats and tanks, and these have been extremely unsuccessful. Unfortunately, the fish doesn't seem to cope very well with these type of um, designs and facilities, and it seems that the pond type situation will be the optimal form of production. The initial stage we'll start with is the um, spawning and typically broodstocks are maintained within are selected there's very limited selection in terms of looking for overall performance disease resistance and a lot of the genetic studies are currently just in the infancy in terms of trying to identify strains for their productivity and susceptibility to dis different disease processes nevertheless broodstock are selected anytime um, in the fall or early spring and they're introduced into br into broodstock ponds these canisters, which are just old war munition tan, um, cans, are identified by these floats, and they're immersed into the water. And essentially, they mimic the natural ecological fit, um, niche that these fish employ to spawn. The females and males are stocked. The females will enter into the canister and deposit the eggs. The male will enter, fertilize the eggs, and then he remains and guards them. So essentially, these canisters are then subsequently checked either on a daily to bi-daily basis. The eggs are recovered and brought into a hatchery-type facility. The eggs themselves are in a very complex gelatinous matrix. And typically, as the fish matures, the number of eggs yielded diminishes, but the overall size and quality of the eggs increases. I should also emphasize, just for a comparative perspective, that channel catfish, that you can have um, successive spawnings in order to retrieve fish, or in order to retrieve eggs and subsequent progeny, whereas in salmon and Pacific salmon that I'll touch on later on, those, the fish tend to die or they're, they're euthanized and the eggs are stripped out and removed. The eggs are then introduced into our hatchery type facility and there's 
considerable variation in terms of the initial capital outlay for these facilities. Here's a fairly modern one that's enclosed. They have aluminum or stainless steel troughs. There's a considerable amount of initial capital expenditure. Whereas in some of these older production facilities, often those that have started 15 to 20 years ago, and the ones that tend to be somewhat more successful, these ones, this was an old pig buyer that was converted into a, an aquaculture facility. Inside you find that these are actually, these tanks are actually constructed out of wood, they're lined by fiberglass, and then the same basic design is, is mimicked between each of the different facilities. This is a farm that was actually from the president of the, Ch of the Mississippi Catfish Farmers Association, and here it's, actually, it's an open facility, the eggs are maintained within these past plastic troughs, and it's, there is just a considerable amount of variation in terms of the design of the, the initial nurseries. Nevertheless, the eggs are immersed within a plastic mesh, and this is something that's consistent no matter which hatchery facility you, you visit. The mesh is designed so that the eggs are able to be retained within the mesh, and then as the eggs start to mature and the fish are hatching, they're able to actually escape between the mesh to the bottom of the trough. You'll notice that there are a number of pale white eggs interspersed within this gelatinous mass or the egg mass itself and these may represent either um, unfertilized eggs or eggs that are with embry early embryonic loss and em early embryonic loss and the real key here is to appreciate that these are frequently nidises for um, either secondary fungal invasions or uh, bacterial contamination and it's very important to continuously monitor these eggs and try and remove them. With channel catfish it's very difficult and the number of treatments which are commercially available is somewhat limited in terms of uh, chemotherapeutics that may be able to control any sort of sub opportunistic agents. Nevertheless, the eggs hatch, and here you might be able to see these very young fish that are um, starting to be collect on the bottom of the troughs. These are referred to as uh, fry, and I'll get back. There are differences between the nomenclature of these very young early stages of the life cycle of these fish between salmonids and channel catfish, but for, for now, what I'd like to do is just emphasize that these are referred to as fry. They have a very prominent yolk sac. You may be able to see where the abdomen is quite distended here. These are maintained within the troughs for variable periods of time, anywhere between 7 to uh, 14 and 28 days. And then they're subsequently transferred to what's referred to as a nursery pond. Here you see that they're just starting to go a little bit larger in size. The yolk sac has been fully resorbed. They've probably just been started on a very fine dust-like feed material in order to get them used to having a, an artificial feed. This is just going back to some how these troughs are actually designed. Water would flow in on one end. They have agitators which maintain optimal oxygen levels as well as di dissipate some of the um, carbon dioxide and any sort of waste products that might be accumulating. These nursery ponds, of which this photograph is one example of, typically are drained after the, the fry have been harvested and then they're maintained over winter and empty over winter and early part of spring and then subsequently restocked. And it's felt by doing this, you actually minimize the accumulation of any pathogens that might be present, as well as the number of scavenger fish, which can have a tremendous impact in terms of um, consuming some of these very young uh, fry that are introduced. Nevertheless, the fry are transferred from the hatchery to these nursery ponds, and the stocking weights vary quite considerably between the size of the fish. They can be anywhere from 150,000 to half a million fish per acre. And the actual size of the pond ranges anywhere from one and a half to two and three acres in size. After a variable period of time, and this can range anywhere from two months to six months, and a lot of it depends on market demand, these fry are, trans are harvested out of the pond by a very fine mesh. They're um, transferred into large transport trucks. These contain oxygenated water, and then they're subsequently either transferred to um, on-growing or production-type facilities. I should mention that a lot of producers actually have their own hatchery facilities on site, and others tend to specialize almost exclusively in just producing hatchery fish that are then shipped to ongoing facilities. The life cycle of these fish, in order, the optimal harvest weight is about a pound and a half to two pounds in, in size, and typically the producers will try and as maintain as uniform a size of fish as possible. In order to maintain that size, it take, or to attain that size, it takes a, between a year and a half and two years. So one thing that I'd like to emphasize here is that these fry or fingerling are actually being introduced into ponds that have year class stock. So essentially there's mixing of different age classes. And that's posed quite a serious problem because there have been studies 
done by Dr. Michael Johnson down at Mississippi State, which have revealed that anywhere between 75 and 85 percent of the fish that are actually introduced into these ponds are lost. And we have no idea in terms of the dynamics of the diseases that are being recruited, the mortalities that are being incurred, but it's yielded very significant. In order to understand some of these disease processes, when I was down in Mississippi, we did, do a, we did conduct a study looking at some of the rates at which diseases are being recruited. These are essentially net, are small cages. They're about a meter and a half in size and a meter in depth, and they're secured to the substrate. We've positioned them next to an aerator and essentially stocked them with 150 to 250 fish and then subsequently serially sampled them and looked over time in terms of the rates of at which did certain diseases occurred and what sort of diseases are actually occurring within these stocks. Some of the data that I'll be discussing a little bit later on in terms of some of the diseases that we encountered is actually extrapolated from these studies. On a more larger scale, oh, sorry. On a more larger scale, we were able to conduct chemotherapeutic studies as well as looking at different treatment strategies to try and control certain diseases. And a particular note was Edwardsia like Deluri or enteric septicemia of channel catfish. And essentially, each of these represents a single treatment cohort, and then we'd have replicates of three, and then uh, we'd have a number of pawns just to try and maximize the, number, the power of the statistics that we were trying to um, discern very subtle changes between the different treatment strategies. Nevertheless, at a year and a half to two years, the harvesting occurs, and this simply entails taking a net, which is strung across the pond, and there's a tractor on either side driving down the levee, and by varying the size of the mesh, they can actually vary the size of the fish which is going to be harvested. These are drawn across, and then subsequently hauled along one side of the shore. I should mention that there is a very interesting disease that's been emerging over the last few years, and typically what farmers will do is have the haulers come in in the afternoon or early evening. They'll haul the, the samples over, and the fish are subsequently maintained in a very small weir along the side of the, the pond, and then there's a small aerator in order to maintain oxygen levels. And what they've been finding increasingly is uh, a disease known as red spot. It's essentially a hemorrhagic or necrotizing myositis, and it's believed to be associated with elevated levels of lactic acid that's essentially causing frank necrosis. And unfortunately, a lot of these fish are subsequently discarded at the processing site. Nevertheless, these fish are subsequently hauled up you have a look at them, you see that they are somewhat fairly uniform in size and very typical features for a channel catfish. They're placed in transport trucks and then uh, hauled to processing plants, of which there's between two and three fairly large cooperative plants and a number of smaller facilities which are used to harvest fish. The fish themselves are taken off the truck, they're weighed and then youth or, um, killed, generally by carbon dioxide or electricity, more frequently by electricity decapitated, and then they go undergo a series of processing um, to yield a final product which varies anywhere from catfish breaded fillets and there are catfish steaks and whole fish. And these are being marketed with increasing demand to facilities with, or to um, producers and wholesalers throughout the Pacific Northwest, the east coast of the United States, Europe, as well as Southeast Asia. I should mention that there has been some talk about regulation not only channel catfish, but any fisheries uh, product, whether it's freshwater or saltwater. And just to emphasize that the Mississippi Catfish, the Catfish Institute itself is trying to um, work with government agencies in order to maintain optimal production uh, and product characteristics. These are just some of the catfish fillets that are being ready to be shipped out. Now, in between actual harvesting the fish, or in between the actual introduction of the stock and then subsequent harvesting, you can have a number of very devastating effects. This was an outbreak of a bacterial infection within channel catfish. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it was enteric septicemia of channel catfish, or ESC. It's caused by Edwardsiella ictalura. These can have very devastating effects um, to producers themselves. Each pond may be worth anywhere between fifty dollars and $100,000 worth of stock. The next shot is actually um, one that I've included just to emphasize the interaction of the environment, the host, and the pathogen. 
These fish had an underlying disease process known as proliferative gill disease. This is a mixosporidian parasite that infects the gills of fish and causes a very profound granulomatous infiltrate. And in so doing, it compromises the respiratory exchange surface of the fish themselves, which is okay. The fish seem to be able to survive in equilibrium with the environment over long periods of time. Unfortunately, or fortunately, within the pond itself, it's a very complex biota. It's a very nutritive, rich environment with a number of phytoplankton communities. In the summer, particularly in July and latter parts of August and early September, these phytoplankton can have a very profound effect on the overall partial pressure of oxygen within the water. During the day, they're actively synthesizing um, oxygen, and during night, they'll be consuming carbon or oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. What happens is that in the very early mornings, say between 4 and 6 o'clock, where the the worst levels in terms of uh, our oxygen levels, they may actually dip to as low as one and even as low as zero parts per million within the water. The you'll have an effect at six parts per million. Levels as low as one and a half to two percent will have a very profound effect in terms of um, contributing to losses of fish. In addition to these fluctuations within water, uh, phytoplankton can also have very profound effects in terms of um, algae or phytoplankton, such as microcystin or anabania, may have a direct lethal effect in terms of entities known as, um, they're very similar to, the microcystin is very similar to pyrolidazine toxicity in horses where you get megalocytosis in the liver of some of these animals. And it's been found in hybrid striped bass as well as Atlant or Pacific salmon off the west coast of Canada. So you can have the effect on the oxygen as well as a direct lethal effect. And in addition, probably the most profound effect of a lot of these phytoplanktons is contributing to an entity known as off flavor. Essentially, it, can, it causes the fish to have a dirt-like taste to it. And these can have a very, very profound effect to the producer. Essentially, what happens, there's a harvest scheduled for a pond. Fish will be submitted to a, a taste tester a month before they're to be harvested, a week before, a day before, and a day of harvest. And if there is any uh, tainting of the flesh detected at any of those stages, the harvest will be um, called off. And there are some ponds that haven't been harvested for over two years because of this entity known as off flavor. In order to overcome some of these problems with very low oxygen levels in the water, what these producers will typically do, this was a shot that was taken at about 5.30 in the morning, they'll have tractors and aerators. And essentially this disperses um, water, it oxygenates the water, and you'll find that there's a margin around these aerators that is just extremely crowded with catfish. They're just trying, they're just gasping for air. Some producers will maintain these and under certain catastrophic, catastrophic events, you'll have mobilization of fairly large numbers of these aerators in order to maintain some degree of oxygenation within the water. This was one farm that we'd been called out to shortly before I left Mississippi. And essentially when my supervisor had talked to the producer over the farm, one of the things that he had Based on the history, these fish had started dying between 3 and 4 in the morning, and there were increasing losses that were being incurred. They tend to be large fish, although there were a small number of smaller-sized individuals that were present. And my supervisor had asked whether the, what the status of the aerators were, and es essentially this is what was happening. Um, you can see where there's just a very small amount of water that's being uh, aerated within this pond, and essentially equipment failure may actually contribute to fairly large losses and on a as well within some of these production facilities. I don't want to give you the impression that fish don't have any premonitory signs, that they're all living at one time and then they die subsequently. There are certain key features that you can recognize, and oftentimes the, the farm hand of individuals feeding these fish or examining them on a daily basis can be your first line of defense. What's happening here is that the producer, the uh, farmhand is going along the levee and dispersing feed into the water and you can see that there is some agitation of water along the side here and essentially it just reflects a good feed response of these the ponds. Here's another one you can see the first the feed being liberated within the air and as it's being settled on the water there's a very active feeding response by these fish. Problems arise when feed is liberated and there's absolutely no response and this really confounds problems in that a lot of the um, acute processes typically may be associated with bacterial infections or you can get super infections with certain bacterial pathogens and the only way that we can really medicate these fish or this stock is formulated so that it's incorporated into the feed. It would be prohibitively expensive to treat in um, individual ponds 
and also the impact from an environmental perspective would be just devastating. Another feature that you may be able to examine on a daily basis in terms of monitoring the, the health status of an individual pond is also individual mortalities within the stocks. Here it's not unusual to find just slight increases in mortality and then over time you may find that these will be uh, washed against the shore. Producers typically will not remove these fish. They're essentially de decomposed by normal bacterial um, breakdown and then re the nutrients are then recycled back into that rich biota within the ponds themselves. Unfortunately, this also sustains and maintains any pathogens which might be present. And a number of them can oftentimes survive for prolonged periods of time associated with organic detritus. Another example, just increasing mortalities. Frequently, by the time it's reached this stage, there's very little that can be accomplished in terms of trying to intervene and control any disease processes. Another thing that can be conducted, you have the feed mortality, but also examination of individual fish. The question is, a producer will bring in a, a capture of fish like this, which is typically associated along the side of the pond. It'll be up in the water column. You can see the skin is darkened. There's probably a mycotic dermatitis. There are probably three to five different types of protozoal pathogens that you may be able, or protozoal parasites that you may be able to pick up on gill scrapes and um, skin scrapes. And the question is, how representative is this individual fish in terms of what's going on in the disease dynamics in that individual pond? So typically, we'll instruct farmers to sample ponds. They'll go out with a treble hook and a, uh, a fishing rod and essentially gaff four fish with, which we recommend there are tens of thousands of fish within these ponds and from a, you know, a statistical perspective it's almost insignificant in terms of subsampling of an individual pond. However, if we can find a certain disease pathogen that we know is associated with a virulent condition in even one of four of, in, of these fish that we examine, then we know that we can institute treatments based on those findings. Just from a practical perspective, I just wanted to touch on some of the um, protocols that are employed within the catfish industry. Typically, when these fish are brought in, we'll examine them and try and assess their overall nutritional status. These guys are actually in a very good plane of nutrition. You can see their abdomens are distended with feed. You also want to assess the state of post-mortem decomposition. In addition, we'll do an external examination. We, in particular, want to examine the base of the fins for any discoloration, whether there's any hyperemia also in the base of the different levels of fins. Uh, immediately underneath the opercular ca um, cover, or this, this is the operculum or the gill cover, we'll reflect that and the gills are situated underneath there. We'll go in with a pair of scissors and essentially clip off two to five filaments and place this in a drop of saline and then examine it with a microscope in order to try and assess any pathogens that might be pr present. And this is really important we found in a number of situations where we've gone in and done gill wet mounts to look at for certain parasites and then subsequently conducted histopathology and the artifactual loss just associated with processing oftentimes will give you a false negative type response so oftentimes it's very important to examine these fish with both with gill wet mounts and and skin scrapes for skin scra skin scrapes typically we'll once again sample the base of the fins as well as the base of the dorsal fin along the dorsum itself. These seem to be prime site predilection sites for certain protozoal pathogens. And it also gives us you know, an idea in terms of what diseases might be present there. And then this is just a fish that we've opened up. And essentially the easiest way to do this because these animals are so bony is just initially in size, just cranial to the vent and then uh, a curvilinear type incision going up to the level of the swim bladder and the kidneys and then bringing it down cranially. This is the esophagus. One thing about channel catfish, which is distinct to salmonids, is that they actually have two separate kidneys. There's a posterior kidney, which is essentially the excretory component, and then interdigitated between the anterior and posterior kidney is a swim bladder. And this is a compartmentalized swim bladder, and then you have the anterior kidney. You have the esophagus, a very simple intestine. I'll show you examples of salmonids and other species where you see some of the diversity in terms of um, how these fish have evolved to exploit different types of feeding strategies. We'll have the next carousel, please. Are there any questions so far?
what I'd like to do now is go on to the salmonid industry, which is and compare some of the differences between the life cycle of these types of species versus that of the channel catfish. This is just once again a saltwater phase of an ongoing facility of, of Pacific salmon off the west coast of Canada. Here we have a barrier uh, net which is used to restrict acta, access to certain par uh, predators which may be found in here. Ideally these should be situated away from natural salmon runs in order to prevent disease recruitment from the production stocks, from the wild stocks, as well as transfer of any potential pathogens from the farm species to the wild stocks as well. This, like the production cycle of these species, once again begins with selection of the brood stock. Here, there's quite considerable manipulation in terms of the genetics. There's triploids um, stocks. There's a number of hormonal manipulations in order tr to try and optimize the overall performance of these species. The brood stocks are typically transferred from salt water to fresh water, and this occurs once again anywhere from one week to four weeks before spawning. Most producers, but not all, will actually inject. Within the dorsal epaxial musculature, there's a small sinus which is situated just cranial to the dorsal fin. They'll inject erythromycin at this time. This is an antibiotic which has been proven to be highly efficacious against a disease known as bacterial kidney disease due to Renibacterium salmoninarium. Due to the extent of this disease on the Pacific West Coast, this has very devastating effects and it is vertically transmitted and it's found that by injecting this erythromycin it seems to decrease the number of pathogens which might be present in order and try and minimize the vertical transmission of this disease. These fish, the broodstock, are essentially examined. They're graded according to their overall size and performance. Here you find these are the females. Their abdomens are distended. What happens is that these animals do have an oviduct but once again, there's considerable variation within different species of fish. With salmonids, the oviduct itself is not fully developed. The eggs essentially rupture through the, dorsally through the mesovarium and they're liberated into the abdominal cavity and then dispelled um, externally through a small pore situa situated around the anus. Essentially, the fish are examined and the, a lot of these fish handlers can actually palpate or manipulate the fish in order to assess whether the actual ovulation has occurred or not. In order to synchronize the spawning, what happens is that the fish themselves are spawned, and this entails initially wiping the external aspect of the fish. Sometimes this, this is disinfected, and then the, the, the eggs themselves are stripped. And what this entails is essentially incising the abdomen from the vent cranially, and then the eggs are liberated. At this stage, um, sperm is introduced subsequently from the male. I want to emphasize that everything is maintained dry because after fertilization, there's a process known as water ha hardening. And essentially what happens is that water, fresh water is introduced and the eggs themselves imbibe the water and they become very turgid. This um, is a process that takes generally between 20 minutes and a half hour. And then these eggs are subsequently sur surface disinfected with iodophores and essentially this minimizes any potential contaminants which might be present. The eggs themselves are then brought into hatchery facilities, and these ones are, again, vary quite considerably between different types of producers. This is actually a government facility off the west coast of Canada, and these are referred to as heath trays. In the past, they have used um, inverted jars quite successfully, but essentially the eggs are introduced, this layer of mesh is removed, and then it, the eggs are in, um, placed on the bottom layer as a mono layer. The eggs themselves are non-adhesive. They tend to be able to be dispersed. And water is introduced from the surface and cascades downwards. And it, the actual tray itself is designed to have the water percolate up underneath the eggs and contribute to a gentle agitation. And essentially, this facilitates gas exchange. Oxygen is able to be absorbed, as well as removal of any waste metabolites which might be present. And then the water essentially accumulates around the margin of the trough and then is, re is removed. As I had mentioned earlier, there is quite a bit of variation in terms of the nomenclature of these very early stages. These are referred to as alevin within the salmonid industry. You can see these very prominent yolk sacs. When the yolk sac itself is, referred, is resorbed, they're referred to as fry. And then with further on growing, the fry acquire the characteristic lateral striations or colorations. And then these are referred to as fingerlings. And then anywhere between six months and a year and a half to two years based on the species, of salmonid, these uh, fish undergo a stage known as smoltification, or they become smolts. Essentially, this is a physiologic change to allow them to adapt from a freshwater situation to a saltwater stage for, in order to enhance the on or in order to accommodate the ongoing stage of the cycle. Nevertheless, these fry are then introduced into um, 
into troughs. Now this is a typical uh, production facility off the west coast of Canada. And once again, this is one of the few that is supplied by groundwater. Essentially, we have a, a reservoir up here for water, which is then gravity fed to individual tanks. Now, in contrast to the catfish industry, where there's um, mixing of your classes, essentially what happens here is one of two things. Fish are either stocked within individual tanks in order to an an anticipated overall yield, or else, and more commonly, what happens is that fish are stocked on, in as uniform a size at as high a stocking rate, in, and then serially they'll be graded and sorted according to size. And it's found that by maintaining as uniform a size of fish, this enhances the overall performance of the stock itself. You find that over time these are essentially split, and then again split, and each successive tank is larger in order to accommodate these larger sized fish. At the end of six months or a year and a half to two years, again, these are transferred from fresh water to salt water. Uh, I'm sorry, one variation on that scheme. This is a, a farm from northern Canada. It's actually an indoor recirculating system. This is a somewhat more intensive form of aquaculture. Essentially, it's an entire open system. Water flows from one tank to another, and then there's mixing of tank water in a central reservoir. There may be a degree of discharge and makeup. Uh, oftentimes this is somewhat limited because of the cost or that may be incurred in order to maintain optimal water characteristics. So this is just another slight variation. It's specifically for salmonids, typically rainbow trout, although other freshwater species, including Arctic char, there seem to be a number of alternative species which are becoming of increasing interest to different producers because of their marketability. And again, um, this is that hatchery facility in Northern California at Moffitt's Creek, and it's just to show another variation on that hatchery type design where you have these long troughs. These are essentially continuous feeders. There's pelleted feed that's very finely ground and essentially it's liberated into the pond, into the troughs below on a continuous slow basis and essentially it maintains a degree of feed available for these very young fish. These fish, um, the rainbow trout, are then transferred into these raceways. And once again, it's rather than using those tanks, now they're using raceways. You have the feed, which now is actually being dispensed on a demand basis. There's a very thin line, uh, a rope, which uh, just touches the surface of the water, and the fish learn through in, um, by touching the water that a small amount of feed is dispensed. This is just one form of feed. It typically, it's not one of the more successful forms, just based on the fact that a lot of times competition You'll have a very large variation in the size of the fish because the um, superior competitors will know where to uh, you know, be. Nevertheless, with the saltwater phase, these are another form of the ongoing tight facilities. They're essentially large circular nets. They can vary anywhere from 9 meters to 15 meters in size. And apparently off the west coast of Norway, they have some of these cages that are half a mile to a mile in size that contain millions of, of stock. And, can actually pose quite a navigational threat in certain instances. And this is another one just off the west coast of Canada, just to show some of the variations in terms of the design. Some of these can actually be separate from shore, and others will actually have be directly anchored to shore themselves. And then this is another variation. This is a land-based type system. And the initial, there were a couple of reasons why these were initially designed and um, implemented in that. It was felt that by having a land-based system, water could be drawn in at depth within a, an inlet and then thereby circumvent any d direct recruitment of pathogens within, the, say, from a typical net exposure where you would have just free flow of water. Essentially, it was felt that by having it very deep in the sub or deep within the inlet, it would circumvent that. Um, in addition, problems along the west coast as well as Norway and Scotland, um, one of the major problems is algal blooms. It's been found that there are certain phytoplankton communities which can pose quite pro um, quite pronounced problems. Uh, Tosterous would be one where you could have a direct physical effect in terms of causing a necrotizing bronchitis. In addition, they can have pose problems in terms of also liberating direct toxins. In addition, part of the reason that it would be of value to try and develop this form of production is that uh, there has been some interaction between recreationalists and fish farm producers and that there is competition for some of the sites off the west coast of Canada and off the east coast, and it was felt by having a land-based system, you essentially could alleviate that and you could situate these farms fairly close to some of the markets. Unfortunately, in order to overcome the, a lot of the initial capital outlay in order to maintain these, they've had to maintain extremely high stocking densities. And 
as much as these have been touted as being ideal situations in or order to control certain introduction of disease problems, we find that there are still uh, case reports of red tide poisoning within these individuals. They still recruit sea lice or Leptopterias from wild fish stocks into these land-based systems. And interestingly enough, it's been found that over time, there are entities known as uh, production-oriented diseases. Uh, Heatress disease may be an example. Um, uh, hemorrhagic cardiomyopathy off the coast of Norway. These are just inverted cones where they essentially inject oxygen into the water in order to maintain um, optimal uh, environmental parameters. So essentially what's happened is that over time there's been a selection more from a uh, disease type, an uh, infectious disease type process going into some of the more interesting production type diseases as we see within the poultry industry. You know, essentially the aquaculture industry is about 30 years to what the poultry industry was from the present situation. The last phase that I'd like to touch on is actually some of these uh, national aquarium type facilities and tropical fish hobbies. This is the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. This is one of the facilities that I have had the good fortune of being having some interaction with. I've also had experience at the Vancouver Aquarium and currently in New York we're hoping to get more involved with some of the aquaculture, or I'm sorry, some of the husbandry and fish disease processes that are going on within the New York Aquarium. Here essentially you have a very broad biodiversity. Essentially fish are being brought in from temperate, tropical and cold, fresh and saltwater facilities and as well as brackish water facilities and it's a real challenge for a lot of these husbandry people to try and optimize the management of these different fish. These are look down fish from the Bahamas and you have clown trigger fish each of these will exploit different types of ecological niches, and you'll see that even their different feeding habits, you see that the mouth on this one is designed for consuming phytoplankton, they're very fine feed, whereas uh, fish such as, or elasmobranchs such as sharks here, they have a completely different nutrient requirement, and a lot of these basic criteria in order to maintain these fish haven't yet been fully um, understood or fully developed within some of these exotic species. Another really interesting entity is even just trying to understand the different susceptibilities of these fish to different types of um, chemotherapeutics. There's a, a protozoal parasite known as um, uronema. Cryptocarium would be one in salt water. And typically, uh, treatment and control is instituted by using copper sulfate treatments. And while it turns out that sharks tend to be uniquely susceptible to copper, and they seem to succumb very, very readily with even minute trace amounts of copper within the water. Similarly, with um, clownfish, as well as the invertebrates, these animals are also extremely susceptible to, to copper treatment. So from a management perspective, individual tanks will have to be set up on entirely different systems in order to maintain them. Invertebrates are increasingly becoming popular, and we're just starting to understand some of the basic anatomy and physiology of these animals in terms of trying to maintain them within facilities. And then a mantis shrimp. exhibit glass would be on the base here and then uh, the fish themselves would be maintained within this exhibit. This is just a different perspective. Essentially on the front here would be the glass where the spectators would be able to examine the fish. Here would be the, the animals on the exhibit and then in the back you'd have the backdrop and essentially these are designed to facilitate access by the aquarist in order to observe fish, to feed them, in order to try and capture any that may need certain manipulations. And each of these tanks typically, although they're on open systems and that a, number, a series of tanks will be fed by one water source, these also typically do have underwater or under gravel filters in order to maintain some degree of filtration in the event of any sort of electrical breakdown or any problems that may arise. Typically, if these fish are being treated, some of them on an individual tank basis, the water can be turned off uh, and filtration will be maintained by that under gravel filter. Just to give you and some appreciation of the complexity of some of the engineering feats that are involved with this. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, you have fish from tropical fresh, tropical salt water. Oftentimes, you can have fairly high um, organic loading. These are diatomaceous earth filters, which are routinely used in order to remove any particulate matters. And typically, these will have um, denitrifying bacteria 
within the sub-Saharan filters, which te seems to be highly effective in terms of controlling nitrogenous waste that do accumulate in, in these tanks. These are just some of the pumps that are used. There are heat exchange units, which are uh, intercalated on some of the systems in order, to, in order to maintain optimal water temperatures. Increasingly, I should say from a, just a historical perspective, fish were caught from the wild, brought into aquariums, and then solely used as an ex for an exhibit purpose. And it's been found that over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been increasing interest in terms of trying to propagate and even reintroduce some of these endangered species, whether they're indigenous or exotic species which are brought in. And some of this entails having to develop new feeding strategies. These are essentially phytoplankton columns that are, are exposed to um, very bright light in order to try and culture these minute um, organisms for very early larval stages, as well as some of these feeders that have very specialized feeding habits. And I think that'll be the first, the end of the first part of the talk. If there's, are there any questions at all? Okay. What I'd like to do now is address some of the diseases that we encounter within the different representative production facilities that I touched on briefly in the last seminar. The initial group will be septicemic. From an epidemiologic perspective, we know that a lot of the pathogens that we find are actually part of the normal flora that's present within the fish. Um, we also find that some of these diseases are found naturally within the environment and can be readily recruited by the fish themselves as well. And interestingly enough, with, particularly with salmonids, we find that as the fish changes from its freshwater stages, the very early production stages, to its ongoing or later stages, we find that there are certain diseases that are reflected within the two groups. There are certain pathogens, particularly bacterial agents, which are found exclusively within freshwater situations others that are found exclusively within salt, saltwater facilities, and others which tend to be able to broach the two, and typically those ones are associated with more chronic stages and are somewhat more insidio insidious in that they're recruited very early on in stage and then tend to manifest later on in the production stages. In addition, temperature fluctuations seem to have a very profound role in terms of uh, predisposing fish to recruiting bacterial infections in particular. We find that this can include variations, rapid variations, within temperatures as well as temperature extremes. So if you have very elevated temperatures in salmonids, temperatures above 18 to 21 degrees Celsius, or very low temperatures, temperatures as low as one to three degrees Celsius, you find that there seems to be some abrogation of the normal immune function, particularly with lymphocytes. This has been demonstrated within in vitro investigations, but as well as probably elaboration of just the general inflammatory processes within these fish. In addition, wild fish reservoirs, as I had mentioned earlier, when you situate your ongoing production facility near natural salmon runs, it's not unusual to have recruitment of diseases between wild fish as well as um, exchange from production fish stocks. And very interesting work has been conducted in Scotland demonstrating plasmid-mediated resistance. And by actually tr um, tracking these plasmids, they've been able to demonstrate where these uh, uh, diseases, particularly associated with bronchiolosis caused by Armonas salmonicida, where this is actually being disseminated within the wild, stick, wild fish reservoirs. This also poses quite an interesting problem for very early stages, particularly within the hatchery facilities. I touched on initially where there were ground fed or aqua aquifer fed water um, for some of the hatchery facilities, and this is actually the most desirable in the sense that it overcomes problems associated with any type of wild fish reservoirs if you're using surface-derived water. Essentially, by using rivers and streams in order to supply water to your stock within a production facility, there is a potential of recruitment from those wild fish reservoirs. In addition, there are invertebrates which are present in which may act as intermediate hosts for a number of different types of parasitic infections. Moreover, by having, um, having fish maintained in um, groundwater based facilities, this seems to overcome problems associated with any potential um, disease recruitments. Husbandry factors are also pose a very interesting and important phenomenon associated with uh, disease recruitment. Overcrowding, as I mentioned earlier, when you're bringing in fish and placing them in situations where they're very stressful, there's reduced disease or transmission, reduced distance for disease transmission, as well as increased frequency of contact. 
there's also an association with poor nutritional plan. We find that fish are, that are generally debilitated seem to be somewhat more predisposed to infection. Trauma can be extremely important. This is, as I had mentioned earlier, with the ongoing grading and sorting of fish. Typically, if you have any type of irritation to the skin, this may provide a, a, a portal for invasion or secondary contamination with certain bacteria and fungal agents. Disease history, this is something that we appreciated anecdotally down in Mississippi, but in those fish that um, were infected very early in the production cycle with trichodina, certain protozoal parasites, we found that subsequently when these animals or when these individual fish were exposed to ESC or um, Edwardsiella ectolura, these seem to be particularly susceptible to infection. Trash fish something, trash fish feeding is something is from a more of a historical perspective. This is a practice that has been long discontinued in North America, however, it was something that was um, continued only until about five to ten years ago within Norway, and essentially this intent entails feeding of offal, or essentially incorporating the viscera from spawned fish into the diet of a lot of the progeny, and this resulted in perpetuation of diseases such as mycobacteriosis, ichthyophonus, herpes virus infections within, within salmonids, and since that practice has been discontinued, it's found that these diseases have subsequently subsided within production facilities. Clinical signs, typically these animals present with acute septicemia as having a very sudden onset. They can have inappetence or anorexia and increasing mortality. These are all of the features that I touched on briefly when we were just examining some of those, um, just giving you an overview of looking at the channel catfish industry in particular, but this is something that's fairly typical of cold freshwater and saltwater fish as well as tropical fish. You can have behavioral changes and swimming abnormalities. Typically, fish will like to shore. We'll see them um, swimming around the margins of the net pens uh, within salmonid industries. Even looking at tracking channel catfish and within some of the ponds, it's found that they tend to aggregate in certain um, groups within the fish, within the ponds themselves. And one of the features of diseases is a lack of shoaling. There can be sl sluggishness, fin clamping, as well as collection of the fish along the edges of the ponds and darkened skin. And this seems to be a very non-specific response of fish to disease, um, just to generalized disease processes. From a gross perspective, you can get con congestion. There's a ascites, which may present a serosanguinous. You can almost get the appreciation of a diphtheritic type membrane in certain disease processes, such as bacterial kidney disease, as well as enlargement of the kidney and spleen. And these are critical organs in terms of the immune function of fish. And I'll get into this a little bit later on when we start to examine some of the different lesions that are encountered. From a histopathological perspective, you can have frank necrosis of um, hematopoietic elements. This is typically associated with endotoxemia. And it varies quite considerably with the, with the nature of the pathogen that's present. Typically, as the pulmonic stages start to subside, you'll have increasing accumulations of hemosiderin as well as melanomacrophage centers within the spleen and kidney. And I'll get into a little bit later in terms of what the, what's believed to be the function of the melanomacrophage centers within these different fish. As well as there may be small islands of hematopoiesis, or in contrast, you may get anemia within the fish themselves. This is a photograph, a gross photograph of a Pacific salmon off the west coast of Canada. This animal was infected with vibrio, and it's just to illustrate some of the gross findings that you can appreciate with these clinically affected fish. Here there's darkening of the dorsum. The fins themselves are clamped, they're dark. You may see diffuse erythema along the margins of the fish. And this area here is a um, secondary fungal infection. This is a saprolegnia type infection within these guys. Another example of Pacific salmon off the coast, this is just a little bit more extensive involvement. Here, once again, you get these areas um, of erythema. This, you may be able to appreciate the scales here along the surface, and then there are areas where there's a loss of scaling. This typically is associated with edema, where you can get raised scales within the derm. I'm sorry, this is edema within the dermis, where you can get raised scales occurring as a sequelae to that. One of the real hallmarks of um, acute septicemia, particularly within ongoing stages of salmonids, is a vibrio infection, of which there's about three or four major forms. There's vibrio angularum, which is the typical septicemic type disease found off the west coast of Canada, as well as throughout North America, Europe, and Norway and Scotland. 
There's Vibrio orgali, which is another acute septicemic form, which is found in particularly long, within Pacific salmon stocks. There's Vibrio um, salmonicida, which is a disease which has relatively only recently been recognized as of about the early 1980s. This is a disease known as Hetra's disease. Um, initially, it was suspected to be uh, due to a nutritional problem. This is actually a gross photograph of an Atlantic salmon from Norway that's infected with Hetra's disease. And here you can appreciate the serosanguinous societies. This is actually the liver, cranially. These are the gonads, and you can see these areas of hyperemia modeled all throughout the cer serosal surface and the swim bladder of this fish. When these fish were initially examined histologically, what they appreciated was essentially a hemorrhagic diathesis. There's breakdown of the muscle fibers. Here's remnants of more normal skeletal musculature. And adjacent to that, you can find this moth-eaten type appearance. There's a fairly sparse to minimal inflammatory infiltrate. This is typically, typically occurs at fairly low water temperatures, and that has a very profound effect on the metabolic activity of these fish and the rate of, disease, of inflammatory recruitment within NIDA of inflammation. This is an area that's more severely affected, and essentially you can see that virtually the, the entire muscle itself is diffusely affected. There's a fairly sparse to minimal, minimal separative infiltrate. There's a few um, histocytes and lymphocytes as well. So when this disease was initially examined, when, the, um, when this disease was initially diagnosed histologically, it was be believed to be due to a vitamin E selenium deficiency. And subsequently, um, muscle examination of muscle and, and liver demonstrated fairly profound differences between vitamin E levels of wild fish and affected fish, or fish affected with Petra's disease. However, a bacteria was subsequently isolated and it since developed a very successful and highly efficacious vaccine, which is used quite widely in terms of trying to to control these, this disease within Atlantic salmon. This is a Pacific salmon off the, north, the west coast of Canada, and this is just a gross photograph of a fish that's infected with Vibrio angularum. And one of the hallmark features of the disease itself is a liquefactive necrosis of the spleen. Here you can see it's the, spleen, the splenic outline is irregular. There's hemorrhage within the adjacent um, fascia. There is a little bit of modeling within the liver. I apologize that this wasn't a slightly higher magnification shot, but it's just to give you an indication of some of the gross manifestations of acute septicemia. This is a photograph from Dr. Rob Armstrong, and it's essentially what they've done is remove the opercular covers, expose the gills, and then within the liver, what you can appreciate are these large modeled areas, essentially areas of hemorrhage. This is a fish that's infected with bacterial kidney disease, and this is more of an acute form of the disease itself. Some of the things to appreciate, the gills themselves are very pale. Typically, these should be a deep, rich red color. And um, the pallor itself might be associated with just generalized um, anemia associated with the inflammatory process. It could be due to some of these hemorrhages that are incurred within the liver. In addition, uh, this disease has a site predilection for the kidneys, and I'll show you that a little bit later on, but there could be a degree of myeloptosis associated with this. Just from an anatomic perspective, here you see these blind ending diverticuli. These are arise from the duodenum of fish. They're referred to as pyloric psyche. They're involved with digestive processes. They believe to be synthesis, associated with synthesis of different types of vitamins. And interspersed between the pyloric psyche are very fine areas of adipose tissue. And within the adipose tissue itself is actually where the pancreatic tissue is localized. So you find the acinar cells um, as well as the endocrine islets found are interspersed within that hematopoietic tissue. And then here's the spleen, just a little bit further caudally. This is just another high power photograph or a gross photograph of a fish that's infected with vibriosis. And it's just to show you once again, this area of um, hyperemia within the liver parenchyma. It sort of extends below the capsule and throughout virtually the entire parenchyma. From a histologic perspective, we find that a lot of diseases will actually localize to the kidney, and this is for a very good reason. Fish, unlike mammals, lack cuffler cells. Their phagocytic cells, or the, the cells of the mononuclear phagocytic system, are actually localized in peritubular sinusoids, as well as capillaries that are found throughout the anterior and posterior kidney. This is essentially a microphotograph of a fish. This is a Pacific salmon that was injected with carbon, and it's just to illustrate where these uh, carbon particles are being phagocytized by endothelial cells or macrophages situated along these um, capillaries here. 
And essentially, it's been demonstrated using autoradiography techniques that any sort of pathogen that is localized there, it's phagocytized and then subsequently transported this to the spleen. And this can occur as readily as within 24 hours after initial challenge. And then based on the nature of the antigen, this can persist anywhere up to six and eight months for some, to confer some degree of protection. In addition, um, the reason I included that initial photograph was just, and this one is just to emphasize how profound uh, this phagocytic function is and how it contributes to a, a predilection of certain septicemias localizing within the, the kidneys. Here's a microphotograph of the posterior kidney of a, uh, a brook trout. This is an animal that was a, that typically, when exposed to a disease agent known as furunculosis or aromonosomonocyta, it has a very fulminant disease process. Essentially, you may be able to appreciate these dark basophilic bacterial colonies that are interspersed throughout. And this is a typical feature that is extremely uh, typical of what you see with frunculosis within salmonids. Essentially, you have discrete bacterial colonies and a very profound lack of inflammatory infiltrate. And this has been attributed based on in vitro studies as well as in vivo studies on elaboration of serine proteases by the bacteria which appear to inhibit complement activation as well as have a direct lethal effect to, to the inflammatory infiltrate. I touched on these melanomacrophages and explained that I would mention that I would elaborate them on a, a little bit further. It's been found that using autoantibodies or antibodies against known antigens that fish when exposed to an antigen what appears to happen is that that antigen is phagocytized and then brought to melanomacrophage centers, and it's, these are believed to be a form of a primordial form of a lymph node, or that's based on the analogy of their function. Cur that's the current thinking. In addition, one thing that is kind of interesting is that with acute septicemias, it's not unusual to have these melanomacrophages liberate or disperse their melanin. And these appear to be a non-specific defense mechanism in terms of the fact that when fish mount an inflammatory response, oftentimes they'll come in and liberate a number of proteolytic enzymes, which can have quite a profound and deleterious effect to the host themselves. And some of these melanin granules may help to mop out some of these free radicals that are being generated. In addition to the kidney's function with um, phagocytosis, it's also the hematopoietic component within the fish themselves. This is a photograph of the anterior kidney of a fish. And it, there's an intermediate sized vessel within the central, center of the, uh, of the image. And this was a fish that was injected with bacterial kidney disease and then subsequently sampled about 36 hours after exposure. And one of the very subtle changes that we appreciated very early in the genesis of this disease is that you'll find that there are hypercellular margins that are localized around these large vessels. And essentially, when you look at these at somewhat higher magnification, we find that these are degenerating or developing neutrophils, so there is a degree of granulopoiesis. And then over time, you'll find that these actually do appear to extend across the endothelium. And when you look at serial blood samples, you can actually see a leukocytosis and characterized by neutrophilia initially, and then you'll have a monocytosis over time. So it's a very interesting analogy in terms of how this in inflammatory response in fish actually is elaborated and the similarities with higher vertebrates. I had mentioned before one of the hallmarks of this disease, when you look at it uh, microscopically, is frank necrosis. And this was a channel catfish that we had injected with Edwardsiella ictalura ESC, or enteric septicemia of channel catfish. And it, essentially what you can appreciate is just frank necrosis of the hematopoietic elements within this channel catfish kidney. The only reason you know it's a kidney is because of this lone tubule that's situated here. And there's some, uh, what appears to be a nerve emanating along the margin of the slide. This is just a slightly higher power magnification, just to emphasize that you have the hematopoietic element, which appears to be profoundly affected, and a, somewhat of a sparing of the um, excretory component. Should also mention that fish do get glomerular uh, nephropathies. There are what appear to be immune-mediated um, membranous glomerular nephritis. We've described a crescentic glomerular nephritis. So there are increasingly a number of analogies that can be derived from fish to higher vertebrates. This is just a higher power photograph of a posterior kidney of a fish that's infected with Ed Edwardsiella ictaluri. Just to show you the frank necrosis, there's hemorrhage, a uh, small amount of edema that may be present within that interstitium. Included this slide, this is a histological section of a gill of a fish, and it's just localizing, uh, uh, localization, just to demonstrate localization of those same bacterial colonies 
within the secondary lamellae of, of the fish themselves, of the gills themselves. And this is just to emphasize that in addition to the kidney and the heart, the endothelium within the atrium and ventricle, there are a number of ancillary sites which have a degree of phagocytic activity. There are fixed phagocytes localized within the gills, within the ependymal cells, as well as in the spleen to a lesser extent, as and endocardium, as I um, alerted to just recently. This is the same sort of change that we appreciated within the posterior kidney. Essentially, you have these discrete colonies. And notice the profound lack of an inflammatory response. These areas look hypercellular, but essentially, this can be attributed to a hyperplasia of the gill epithelium. Essentially, these are, rem are the secondary lamellae. The primary lamellae or the gill filament would be extending vertically within this photograph. And the secondary lam lamellae would be emanating laterally. And essentially what you have is a hyperplasia of the respiratory epithelium, which appears to encompass and encircle these bacterial colonies. These gills receive a large degree of, uh, essentially blood is pumped directly from the heart through the gills, so they have a very high rate of perfusion, and hence are very prone to um, being site for sites of identification of certain pathogens, and it's extremely important, just from a practical perspective, to really examine the gills as closely as possible. The next group of diseases I'd like to touch on, and these ones are actually of considerable significance, not only from um, contributing to morbidity within fish, but also from an aesthetic perspective, not only for a uh, final product for consumers, but also for, say, with an aquarist in terms of maintaining fish that are appear normal and healthy. This condition is erosive and ulcerative. From an epidemiologic perspective, the same criteria that contributed to acute septicemias typically are the same ones that you're going to see with ulcerative conditions. Oftentimes, the flora that's present with on, on the fish themselves, trauma, any sort of manipulations are all critical in terms of uh, predisposing these fish to infections. Clinical signs, typically uh, fish, from a comparative perspective, they have a cuticular layer. This is about a, a micron in thickness. It's composed predominantly of mucopolysaccharides. It contains nonspecific um, defense agents such as uh, lymph uh, I'm sorry, immunoglobulins, which seem to be quite specific. There's lysozymes as well as free fatty acids, which all contribute in a non-specific means to try and control um, superficial and colonization of certain pathogens. Typically, with very early stages of ulceration, it, ulcerative and erosive type conditions, it's not unusual to see a bluish or gray sheen on the surface of the fish. And fish, uh, Pacific salmon, typically infected with trichodina along the dorsum, you'll start to see a proliferation or a hypersecretion of goblet cells in the mucus will line the dorsum and it'll give it this, this typical sheen that's present. In addition, you may be able to appreciate erythema as well as ulcerations and erosions that can actually be quite superficial in that they appear almost white or blanched. Essentially, they've gone through the, the epidermis and extended down to the superficial dermal layer where a lot of the iridophores and the pigmented containing cells are present and you have a loss of these and essentially just remnants of dermis that are retained Typically, the healing response can be impaired by necrotic debris. It's very unusual for fish to get second intention type healing. Unlike higher vertebrates, or I'm sorry, unlike terrestrial vertebrates, their superficial layer of skin in fish is alive. And so repair typically is by rapid mitotic activity and migration of the epithelium to try and breach or to extend over and encompass that breach. So anytime you have necrotic debris or any sort of secondary invasion, whether it's fungal or bacterial, if that impedes that migration process, then it will essentially impair the fish's ability to try and resolve that lesion. And once again, the distribution can be quite localized or fairly extensive throughout the, the fish. Histologically, it's typical erosions and ulcerations. There's a very profound osmotic gradient within fish. If they're in freshwater um, habitats, you'll find that there'll be a fairly large influx of water from the environment into the fish themselves, and you'll get fairly marked subcutaneous edema. You can get skeletal muscle degeneration and necrosis. And frequently, secondary bacterial or fungal in, um, infection is not an unusual finding. Just in passing, I'll mention that the blood volume of fish is about one, one and a half to three percent total body weight, and the lymphatics is about four times that. And of the total lymph volume that's present within fish, it's about eight percent, six to eight percent body weight. About 80% of that is actually found within the dermis. 
So anytime you have a breach in the integument, you can have very profound effects in terms of the, um, the serum protein levels and ionic gradients that are present within the lymph itself. So it's very important to appreciate that. In addition, anytime you see, you handle a fish and you have scales that are being removed, the scales themselves are actually within the dermis, below the epidermis. And, and any time that you have scale loss, you should remember that that's a breach in the integument. Some of the differentials that you may consider when you're looking at an erosive or ulcerative condition include septicemia, trauma, parasites. These can be protozoal as well as metazoan, and I have representative examples of both, and certain environmental conditions. One of them would be sunburn, and this may seem somewhat peculiar, knowing that UV light doesn't penetrate that deep in the water column, but it turns out that in areas where they've introduced rainbow trout, such as in South America, in order to find habitats that are cool enough for the fish, they need very low water temperatures. They've had to go to high altitude farming, and it turns out by having these fish at very high altitude, they seem to get sufficient exposure to develop typical sunburn regions, and they have the starburst cells that are present. And it's very um, homologous changes that we see within higher vertebrates. In addition to predators, and these can evoke a, a a traumatic lesion that can have a very profound effect as well as just frank consumption of a lot of the products themselves. This is just a gross shot of a channel catfish. It's the head of a channel catfish. Just to demonstrate an acute um, ulcerative condition, this fish was infected with Eduardiella ictaluri or ESC. Here you see that the cuticular change where there's a gray blue sheen overlying this area. The Cells that secrete this, uh, the goblet cells, they secrete these mucopolysaccharides. Their distribution varies considerably over the, the fish from a topographic perspective, as well as variations that occur associated with spawning, with the age of the fish, and different locations. They tend to be localized in one area in particular along the dorsum here, and essentially they liberate their secretions, and then through water, their, the secretions themselves are drawn over the remainder of the fish. But here you see this diffuse change, or I'm sorry, this locally extensive area, this hyperemia, as well as these punctate ulcerative lesions. This is another photograph of a fish infected with Edward Diella ictaluri, just to show more diffuse involvement. This is essentially, this is the ventral aspect of the head. Here you have the opercular coverings, and then these long tentacles. These animals are essentially bottom dwellers. They're sifting through the sand to try and find any prey. This is a photograph from Mississippi State. Here we have multiple punctate lesions. They're ulcerative, they're solitary to coalescing. You see them along the entire flanks of the animal. Essentially what's believed to happen is that these are, the bacteria are being localized hematogenously into dermal vasculatures. They're causing a necrosis and evoking an inflammatory response and then subsequently resulting in an ulcerative type condition. This is a very interesting entity that we recognize within channel catfish. This is referred to as hole in the head. And this is separate to hole in the head type disease of tropical fish. And I've got representative photographs of that coming up a little bit later. This is actually due to an infectious agent. This again is ESC or Eduardiella ictaluri. The pathogenesis appears to be hematogenous dissemination of the bacteria and they localize you know, in the vasculature above the head. And then the bacteria themselves appear to elaborate collagenases and elastases. And essentially they erode superficially until they extend through the epidermis. That's just a lateral view. This is a dorsal view of a fish that's infected. And essentially, you have this large ulcerative lesion that's just uh, parasagital. And you know it's fairly well demarcated. And it extends quite deep into the dermis itself. These can result in frank loss of fish. However, most times, we do come across fish where there's actual cicatrization. And here, you just have contracture down of that nidus. And this fish actually had two of them. We've got more dramatic lesions coming up just to illustrate these changes. But this is hole in the head disease of channel catfish and it's due to Eduardiella ictaluri. Are there any questions so far? Thank you. This is another disease that we recognized in our trials, the submerged cages that we had introduced into the pond. This is Eduardiella tarda, this is, causes an emphysema, this necrotizing myositis. This is a disease that appears to be emerging with increasing importance within the aquaculture industry. 
This is, um, I should mention channel cat enteric septicemia, channel cat, which is something that was recognized only as early as 1972, and then since then has escalated in importance and is probably one of the leading causes of mortality in the ch channel catfish industry currently. This, however, is another disease that appears to be emerging. And essentially, you get very profound periorbital and retrobulbar edema. You can see where there's um, this erythema along the margins. This is very typical of Popeye, you think of. In Salmonids, this Popeye is typically associated with gas supersaturation. It can also be due to um, embolic localization of bacteria in the choroid reet on the posterior margins of the eyes. It's a very vascular organ, and it seems to be another prime site predilection for localization of bacteria. Nevertheless, it's not unusual to have dehiscence and loss of that overlying epidermis and within the affected areas. And this is a fish that was actually recovered from a pond, and it was still swimming. We isolated pure cultures of etarda from the kidneys and from the brain, although I mean, there was considerable contamination within the brain, but the kidneys and internal organs re re recovered pure etarda. Just a reminder, channel catfish, this is an animal that you may get presented to you in a, a diagnostic lab, and you get these um, areas of hyperemia along the base of the pectoral fins. You may be a faintly diffuse erythema on the base of those fins. There might be a little bit of reddening around the perculum and fairly marked abdominal distension. When you open these up, there's a serosanguineous societies, and you may start thinking of a bacterial infection. This is a fish that's infected with channel catfish virus. This is a herpes virus infected infection of channel catfish, and it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. This can cause devastating losses in very young fish, and it seems that those that recover can subsequently go on and become carrier fish and act as a source of contaminant or infection for subsequent generations of fish. That's one of the few viral infections that are currently recognized within channel catfish. There's also a real virus that's been described in Northern California. And unfortunately, there's very little known about the pathogenesis of the dis that disease within channel catfish. Now we're getting on to some of the salmon. This is a disease or a photograph of a representative of a disease of extreme economic importance within the salmonid industry. This is Aramona salmonicida or furunculosis. This is a disease um, that's found predominantly in cold water situations. It tends to occur primarily in freshwater situations, although it has been sporadically diagnosed in saltwater stages of production. It's due to a gram-negative non-motile rod. Um, there are three major groups of bacteria that have been identified. There's Aramona salmonicida, salmonicida, which is the type species. This is a pigmented bacteria, which is non-motile, and it typically affects predominantly salmonids, although it has been sporadically diagnosed in non-salmonid species. There's Aramona um, salmonicida acromogenes. This is the atypical strain, which has been identified within salmonid species. Um, this is the one that's been identified primarily within salmonid species. And the third group is Aramona salmonicida uh, nova, and this is an atypical strain that's been found in non-salmonid species. This is essentially associated with carp dermatitis, um, carp dropsy syndrome, and so on that I've got photographs of, just to demonstrate some of these very unusual bacteria. Grossly, it's very unusual for these guys to actually present with a very fulminant form of these cavitating dermatitis. That is one of the major features of a very chronic disease, but typically you only see those primarily in brook trout and brown trout. They seem to be almost used as sentinel species. They're extremely susceptible to aromonas infections. This is essentially a, a cavitating dermatitis. There's localization of the bacteria within the dermis, and then it evokes that inflammatory response. We saw the photographs of the histological presentation of this disease a little bit earlier, and this is just a representative example of the gross um, photo, gross pathology. This slide was kind of given by Dr. Rob Armstrong. This is just a koi, and typically, once again, you'll get those subdermal cavitations. It's di very difficult to appreciate in the slide, but essentially there was a large vesicle or cavity that was fluid-filled. It contained uh, red, flocculent material interspersed within a very serous type of and then this is a gross photograph of carp erythrodermatitis. This is an entity that's recognized in Eastern Europe of extreme importance. This is a fish that they commonly consume. Um, certain ethnic groups will have a, um, a propensity to consume different types of fish, and this is a very popular staple found in Eastern Europe. And essentially, it presents with these very punctate, 
ulcerative type lesions and it's associated with an atypical aeromonas infection. I should mention that carp dropsy syndrome, which is of which this is part of that complex. Carp dropsy syndrome, in addition to the atypical aeromonas infection, also involves typically a rhabdovirus coprio, as well as a spherospora infection. This is a mixosporidium, so it frequently there's a complex interaction of the three different groups. When you're presented with a furuncle on a fish, and uh, this is a term that was initially instituted in the very early 1900s and has since become entrenched within the literature, and it's not really a furuncle, it's uh, fish don't have that nexa. If there was an entity or an anatomic um, structure which would be close to it, it would be a scale bed. These lesions typically are subdermal cavitations and necrotizing myositis. There are a number of bacteria which can present with similar features as bronchiolosis. This is Haemophilus infection. And you may be able to appreciate this blanching of the skin and just irregular subcutaneous areas. There's area of erythema. This is due to Haemophilus piscium. In addition, this is a chlamydia, or I'm sorry, this is strawberry disease. It's found within rainbow trout. This is believed to be due to a chlamydia, though they have not successfully identified or isolated an entity which they can fulfill postulates. However, this is just based on some preliminary studies, it looks like it's probably a chlamydial agent. Interestingly enough, this presents as a lichenoid type inflammatory response. And this, I should mention that fish, in as much as they have fairly profound ulcerative and erosive conditions, they are very, they don't seem to elaborate very um, profound. They don't seem to elaborate the same type of changes that you would see in higher vertebrates simply because they lack a neck cell and, they, and because of the osmotic component in terms of any sort of breach within the, the integument it seems to evoke quite a profound change, as well as secondary bacterial or fungal invasion. This is enteric reg mouth septicemia of rainbow trout. This is due to Yersinia ruckeri. Once again, this is an entity which has been found within rainbow trout. Fortunately, there's been a very successful vaccine that's been developed, but once again, this can present with those same type of gross changes that you appreciate with just bronchiolosis. This is another one, channel catfish. This is a channel catfish that was infected with Aeromonas hydrophila. This is a motile bacteria, gram-negative rod, and it, typically if we were presented with a salmonid with Aeromonas hydrophila infections, we would suspect that this is a secondary bacterial contamination due to some other underlying disease process. Interestingly enough, in channel catfish, it's probably a primary pathogen. There's enough of these fish that present with in the clinics with no histologic lesions aside from this cutaneous involvement and we don't really understand the pathogenesis of the condition. But as I say before, with salmonids, typically you would suspect it's some sort of secondary bacterial invasion. This is an entity known as cold water disease or peduncles disease. Now we're getting to these mixobacterial invasion uh, infections. From a historical perspective, these diseases were classified as mixobacterium. However, subsequent review of some of these isolates and further characterization of the bacteria, it believes, it's believed now that a lot of them are not necessarily mixobacteria, but rather cytophaga. There are two major groups, the mixobacteriales and cytophagales, and within the cytophagales, there's flexibacter and cytophaga, and these are gram-negative filamentous bacteria, and it's likely that these organ, that a lot of the diseases which historically have been classified as mixobacteria are in fact probably Flexibacter or Cytophaga. This is a disease that's due to Flexibacter or Cytophaga um, psychrophilia. This is um, cold water disease or peduncle disease. Typically it presents with, with water temperatures between 3 and 12 degrees. This is a, a photograph of a Pacific salmon of which there's, this animal seems to be particularly prone to this disease. It's found off the west coast of Canada and it's not unusual to have them arise in smolts just before they're ready to be transported, transported to salt water. And epizootics of this disease have actually been identified in ongoing stages in saltwater production facilities. And essentially, this is a very severe necrotizing stomatitis and gingivitis and extending up the rostrum of this fish. You can see these areas of erosion. Essentially, it's lost the rostrum here. The caudal peduncle, this area where there's a shortening as you extend from the, tor the dorsa dorsal fin, there's a narrowing in the, to in, the, in the body of the fish itself, and this is known as the caudal peduncle, and this is another 
site that seems to be particularly affected by this disease. There's a century in necrotizing um, dermatitis, myositis, and it seems to extend quite deep into the epaxial as well as hypaxial skeletal musculature. These frequently extend circumferentially around the caudal peduncle. When you examine these microscopically, what you see is accumulation of abundant amount of eosinophilic necrotic debris centrally within that lesion, as well as these small nests of bacteria. You might be able to appreciate them fairly deep down. You'll see that there's a fairly sparse to minimal inflammatory response, and this is getting back to that cold water disease and low metabolic activity and lack of inflammatory infiltrate. These next series of photographs um, demonstrate subsequent um, serial sampling at different levels within that nidus. So this is another area, and here, here you see the, the bacteria. This is somewhat more florid. It's accumulating superficially, and it's just starting to track down between fascial, fascial planes. There's a degree of hemorrhage. There's necrotic muscle fibers, as well as a, um, just accumulation of fibrin. Slightly higher power of magnification. This is remnants of the dermis. There's a compact dermis, and you can see where these bacteria are essentially insinuating themselves between dermal fibers. And as you progress laterally, you'll see that there's more intact dermis here superficially. There's loss of the epidermis. There's some hemorrhage in the subjacent area. And then as you extend more peripherally, you find that there are remnants of epidermis. And here, you're just starting to have some degree of dehiscence. In the subjacent skeletal musculature, you see that there's a degree of edema, some hemorrhage, as well as a granulominous infiltrate. I should mention, just from a comparative perspective, you see the scale bed here? I'll show you some photographs of channel catfish a little bit later on, and if you can keep in mind what this epidermis looks like as well, we'll just use it, I'll just compare some of the anatomic features between salmonids and catfish in the next disease that I'll be talking about. Just a slightly higher, higher power magnification, you can see these bacteria in the surface here, and then the epidermis is just starting to lift off. The next disease I'm going to talk, oh, I'm sorry, this is Every time that you're presented with an erosive or ulcerative condition, it's important not to hone in exclusively to a bacterial in infection. This is an Atlantic salmon off the coast of Norway. These slides are kindly provided by Dr. Trigley Poppe. But here you have a very severe and extensive erosive condition that extends quite deep down into this subjacent skeletal musculature. And this is actually due to an ectoparasitic copepod. This is Leptheopherius salmonis. These are referred to as sea lice. It's very important to examine the fish in order to try and ascertain the prevalence of this parasite within the population. Typically in Scotland and in Norway, this disease is one of the, the major losses of salmonids. And fortunately, um, within the latter part of the uh, 80s, I'm sorry, the latter part of the 70s and the early part of the 80s, there was a considerable amount of work done in order to get uh, dichlorovos licensed for use within the aquaculture industry. This was subsequently um, withdrawn from the market because it also has a very profound effect on lobster larvae as well as some of the invertebrates which are commercially farmed on the, in Scotland. However, it was subsequently reinstituted simply because of the losses of, of farms associated with this disease. I should emphasize that there are two major forms of parasites that have been recorded. There's Leptopteria salmonis. This is a highly host-specific parasite. And typically what producers will do is examine fish just visually in the tanks that they're in the enclosures themselves, and they'll try and assess um, anywhere between 10 and 20 parasites per fish is within acceptable limits. However, once you start getting beyond a level of about 20 parasites, you'll start to want to consider instituting treatment. Whereas on the other hand, um, Caligus elongatus is a parasite that is very has a very broad host um, host species that are known to be infected. So when you go to treat salmonids with, affected with sea lice, it's very important to distinguish between the two groups. If you go to treat Caligus infections, typically they'll just jump off the fish and go on, on to any sort of scavenger fish that even be reported from invertebrates within the substrate. So it's really important just to assess what type of parasite is actually present in order to ensure that the treatment will be effective or not. Secondary bacterial invasion with, associated with Vibrio is not unusual with that particular type of species. This is a flatfish. There's, this isn't a turbid, but there has been increasing interest in Scotland and in Europe to formulate um, or to start to farm place as well as turbid. And it's been found that by bringing in soil or sand 
and in replacing that in tanks to function as a substrate, they inadvertently introduce certain pathogens, and one of them happens to be Vibrio. And it's not unusual for these fish to present with these very um, ulcerative lesions. This is the blind side down. The, you know, the eyes are situated on the other side of the fish. This is the ventral fish aspect of the fish, which is would be typically resting on the substrate. And it was found that by actually removing the, uh, the sand from the tanks that it actually resolved this problem. This is a look down, typical fish that you might find in an aquarium facility. We would find these in Chicago and isolate a variety of different types of Vibrio infections from them, but it's our feeling that Vibrio within an aquarium situation is typically, although not exclusively, it's typically secondary to some other disease process. So it's not unusual to have a primary um, hepatic lipidosis that's really se severe, or what they call lipoid liver disease, where there could be problems with social interactions and predisposing this fish to um, succumbing to a secondary bacterial infection. This is a very unique presentation that's been identified within Ontario. These slides were from Rob Armstrong. This is known as salmon spawn, uh, spawning rash. This is due to bacterial kidney disease and essentially you have localization of the bacteria in the scale beds of the skin. They weren't able to um, culture or isolate the bacteria from any other um, organs internally. It seems to be an entity which is uh, exclusively cutaneous. Just a very interesting change. Typically this bacteria is something that localizes multisystemically. And it didn't appear to be some an atypical form of the disease at all. This is another erosive and ulcerative condition within salmonids. This is um, columnaris disease, due to flexibacter columnaris or saddle patch disease. It essentially present, presents as these blanched areas that um, extend ventral laterally along the dorsal fin. This is a very young rainbow trout. You can actually see that these can sometimes extend quite deep into the paxioskeletal musculature. There's erosion and loss of the interray membranes within the epidermis here. This same sort of disease will also occur within channel catfish. This is just a very broad plexibacter. There's about seven different um, species, and I don't think that the pathogenesis of any of these diseases have actually been fully resolved, particularly within channel catfish. The next series of photographs is just to show you the variation that you can get. It can be locally extensive to segmental to just extensive involving virtually the entire length of the fish. They can be very superficial. Those areas that are blanched, once again, are just loss, associated with loss of the superficial, I'm sorry, with the epithelium and in the superficial dermis where those melanophores are, are situated. This is a photograph showing somewhat more deeper extension of this process into the subjacent skeletal musculature. Bacterial gill disease, this is an extremely important, economically important disease, particularly in some of those recirculating systems I had touched on in the very first presentation. This is due to a number, once again, there are a number of different types of flexibacteria that have been associated with this disease. And more recently, Dr. Drew Ferguson at Guelph has identified a primary pathogen, a flavibacterium, branchiophilium. Typically, this disease is associated with poor water quality, where there's high nitrogenous waste, overcrowding, low oxygen levels. And essentially, when you examine the fish grossly, what you appreciate is just this blanching on the distal tips. And you may be able to appreciate it more proximally. There's an increased amount of mucus and a degree of hemorrhage. It's something that's uh, quite subtle to appreciate, but essentially what's happened is they've removed the operculum and then you have this distal involvement. This disease, bacterial disease, if it's due um, to branchiophilium or to some of the flexibacters which are specific to bacterial gill disease, it should be non-necrotizing. What happens is that you get a degree of senechia, the secondary filaments will tend to fuse, you'll get hyperplastic responses. In areas where there's more of a necro necrotizing bronchitis or inflammation of the gills, here you have a locally extensive or segmental necrotizing bronchitis, there's probably secondary invasion associated with um, fungal elements, but this is probably likely due to a flexibacter that's distinct to the etiologic agent of bacterial gill disease, which now is the, the flavibacter. The way that you distinguish the two between the two, I, I believe, is whether one actually glides. These typically form a haystack arrangement and they have a gliding type motion and lady bacteria don't glide. This is just removal of one of the gill arches. Here you have a supporting cartilaginous base and then from the cartilaginous base, you'll have a, uh, an array of primary lamellae or filaments. In the old literature, they would refer to these as filaments. 
and essentially this should have a uniform contour around and what you may be able to appreciate is just a degree of erosion that extends even as much as 50% of the width of the, the primary lamellae themselves. There's also fairly marked hemorrhage in different areas. There's probably um, areas of infarction as well. This is just a photograph, a low power micrograph of a, of a normal gills from a fish, just to demonstrate those primary lamellae. And then radiating at fairly regular intervals are the secondary lamellae. And those are actually the functional exchanging of the fish. Just for a review, once again, the primary lamellae, this is the supporting structure, and in the past has also been referred to as the filament. And then the secondary lamellae, or refer, what is referred to as just the, um, the lamellae in the past. And essentially, respiratory epithelium, the progenitor cells are situated at the base of these crypts and undergo division. And it takes about 10 days, eight to 10 days out of 12 degrees Celsius in rainbow trout for these cells to migrate off the, to the distal limits and then they're subsequently sloughed. It's not unusual, uh, I'm sorry, in addition to the epithelial component, you also have pillar cells, and these are essentially cells that are, resemble a, a vase type structure, and they essentially function to maintain the two epithelial components attached to one another. And then interspersed between the pillar cells are very small vascular channels. And these vascular channels are designed so that water will flow in one direction, Essentially, water would flow into the screen and the blood flow would go in a counter-current type mechanism. And this seems to optimize the degree of oxygen exchange. This is a low-power micrograph of a catfish that was infected with bacterial gill disease. One thing that we found out was kind of interesting is that this tends to be very segmental. You can have a severely affected gill and adjacent to that, you can still have fairly viable tissue. Here, there is some hyperplasia. I'll just show you a slightly higher Power. This is, I'm sorry, this is actually another gill that's more severely affected. And here you get at approximately the mid-level of the primary lamellae, distally you have just frank necrosis of the respiratory epithelium associated with this disease. This is another photograph. This is a uh, GMS stained slide of a fish that was infected with bacterial gill disease just to demonstrate that it's not unusual to have secondary fungal invasion. And you may be able to appreciate these fungal hyphae that are extending into the, the vascular sinus, which is associated with the primary lamella itself. Just a very unusual presentation in that you get fairly viable tissue adjacent to these um, necrotizing, this necrotizing bronchitis. I referred to, to you earlier about the hay stacking arrangement of the bacteria, and that's very typical of bacterial gill disease. And here you have these hay stack type arrangements of the bacteria associated with the secondary lamella. And essentially, all of this tissue is just necrotic. Slightly higher power, you might be able to appreciate that the bacteria are invading within those capillaries, within the secondary lamellae. And then the primary lamellae, you have these vascular sinuses, and it's actually extending into that. This next slide is um, a photograph of the posterior kidney of a Pacific salmon that was infected with a very severe case of bacterial gill disease. And essentially, the bacteria enter into the bloodstream and you have hematogenous dissemination and localization to those um, periportal sinus, sinusoids, those highly phagocytic areas, and it's not unusual for them to have bacteria localized there. This is a new methyl in blue stain, which seems to be extremely an extremely good stain for demonstration of these bacteria. One differential for bacteria that are localized within the epithelium of the gills, this is epithelial cystis or this is due to a chlamydial infection. This is a disease which we recognize both in salmonids and channel catfish. There have been individual case reports in broodstock that have caused fairly massive mortalities. This is just a very unusual organism. It's typically associated with very high organic loading. I think what we might do is break here and then come back for the last part of the session, if that's okay. This next disease is kind of an interesting example of how temperature modulates inflammatory and immune function within these fish, within channel catfish, but there's also examples that I'll draw on from the salmonid industry as well. 
This is an entity known as winter mortality. And from a historical perspective, the catfish industry was designed that fish were introduced in the spring and harvested entirely in the fall. However, because of increasing market demands and um, designs by the producer, they wanted to have fish available on a year-round basis. So essentially what they've done is started to overwinter fish through December, January, and February, where temperatures are so low that oftentimes these fish literally just shut down their entire metabolic activity. Particularly in July, oftentimes producers won't even feed these stocks. They'll go out and examine them and they'll find that there may be mortalities. And typically when they present to us in the, in the uh, diagnostic service, we find that there's locally extensive mycotic dermatitis. And essentially there's these large areas. They're fairly well sort of demarcated. They're usually along the lateral aspects of the flanks. They're typically at the greatest angle or the greatest width of the fish. And one of the things that we were thinking is that as these fish are being harvested, you know, the larger stock are being removed from the population, but these other ones that are essentially fighting their way through the nets themselves may actually be inflicting some degree of excoriation or trauma along the lateral aspects of the torso. With increasing water temperatures, one of the things that we start to identify is a very uh, thin to moderately thick margin of erythema that seems to encompass these areas. This would be at around 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And then as the temperatures even increase even further, what we find is that there's complete dehiscence of the epithelium within the evolved areas. Essentially, you get this deep, deep pigmented area that's fairly well demarcated all in here. There's essentially loss of the epidermis and the superficial dermis, and what's left is just the dermal component. And in some areas, it can actually be quite extensive and extend quite deep into the subjacent skeletal musculature. You can appreciate where you have that abundant lymph present that that would provide a very rich nutrient to substrate for secondary bacterial or fungal invasion. This is an entity known as winter mortality. What I wanted to illustrate with this slide, this is a photomicrograph of a normal catfish skin that was sampled along the flank of the animal. You'll appreciate that there's no scales in this individual. And these large pink cells, these are alarm substance cells. These are very typical of cyprinodonts. These apparently have a role in acute um, stressful situations where their, their contents are liberated into the environment. And it's, I don't particularly know the exact role or function of these cells, but they are believed to be associated with acute stressful situations in fish. And once again, you have this very broad, compact dermis. Some of the very early changes that we were able to characterize with this disease is marked spongiosis throughout the epithelium. There's a degree of edema and hemorrhage. And then once again, inflammatory infiltrate. This is predominantly granulomatous. And right here, it's probably mild to moderate. Slightly higher power magnification just to demonstrate that edema. There's these remnants of these alarm substance cells and then the hemorrhage in the superficial dermis. Some of the, another very early change is an interepithelial or interepidermal cleft formation. We also appreciated um, within the basilar region, region, region of the epidermis, as well as in the mid-epidermal regions and in the subdermis, there are these micro cavities that are formed, the vesicles or blebs, and these are very commonly found within fish associated with traumatic lesions. One of the differentials, of course, would be an autoimmune type condition. We ran immune, immunoglobulins with immunofluorescence. We weren't able to demonstrate any of those, which is consistent with some sort of immunosuppression type phenomenon, uh, you'll start to appreciate that there is a degree of more inflammatory infiltrate as well as hemorrhage within the dermis. This is just a slightly po higher power magnification to demonstrate these vesicles that are starting to be localized within the epidermis. What happens is as the, the disease progresses, we find that there's complete loss of the epidermis. Here are remnants of dermis and then invasion of mycotic elements. So essentially you have a secondary fungal invasion and here it's extending into the hypodermis, and you're starting to see some myocellular degeneration and necrosis within the epaxial skeletal musculature. There's a degree of edema. These fungal hyphae you find will actually extend quite deep. This is a slightly later phase where here you have extensive accumulation of fungal hyphae. There's complete loss of the dermis and essentially necrosis and extension of the fungal, necrosis of the skeletal musculature and hypodermis and extension of these fungal hyphae deep into the subjacent skeletal musculature. Interestingly enough, if you look at the hypodermal blood vasculature, you will actually see fungal hyphae extending across the endothelium, as well as in the lumen of some of these blood vessels. And this would be somewhat reminiscent of like aspergillus infections in birds or mycotic ruminitis in, in cattle.
after having said all that, the disease that I just described is very typical of the presentation that we find on the west, western part of Mississippi, whereas on the eastern part, their winter mortality typically affects only the appendages of the fish. So it's just kind of an interesting um, manifestation between the two different regions. From a historical perspective, again, another disease that's found in Scotland, this is something that was characterized in the early 70s by Professor Roberts and was actually part of the start of veterinary involvement within fish pathology, or at least a very profound contribution. This is ulcerative dermal necrosis, and actually to believed to be um, associated with the same mechanisms due, um, associated with winter mortality. This is essentially what now is believed to be due to a fungal infection associated with frost um organisms and it's associated with just generalized immunosuppression associated with either fluctuations in water temperatures or associated with spawning. Similar changes have been noted in cage culture facilities off the east coast of Canada where water temperatures have become so low, essentially it completely shuts down the immune function. Studies on even within channel catfish associated with winter mortality have demonstrated that there is a change in the phospholipid components of the, the lymphocytes which appear to have uh, an immunosuppressive type phenomenon associated with that. And then this is just another ulcerative condition we believe to be a, cl a clostridial infection within channel catfish. Clostridial organisms are found normally or commensally within fish, within the gills, as well as in gastrointestinal tract, and acute myositis, or necrotizing and emphysematous myositis have been associated with a number of diseases, both in tropical fish, in aquarium type settings, as well as in um, a production stock, particularly in Eastern Europe, where it's known as bankruptcy disease. Just want to touch on, I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible to get onto the granulomatous diseases, but this is white spot disease in a, rain, or in a salmon. And essentially, we have a number of these pipe, these punctate white foci along the flanks of the fish. This is a channel catfish presenting with a similar type disease. And as much as that occurs on the skin, it likely also occurs within the gills of these animals. The life cycle of the parasite, you have the tomite, which is the infective stages. It localizes on the, on the fish and is transformed into a trophozoite. Trophozoites are capable of, it's believed to have a from the fish and then subsequently settling on the substrate in as therons and then um, undergoing division and then releasing more of these tomite stages. At one time this was believed to contribute to more loss, tonnage loss of fish than all other diseases combined and it's extremely important not, not only within warm water and cold water production facilities but also within aquarium fish stock. should mention that in aquarium facilities my experience has been that this is typically associated either with massive exposure of tomites or to secondary generalized debilitation or immunosuppression of the host fish. Oftentimes we find that if this parasite is enzootic within water systems and either introduction of naive fish or sudden fluctuations in temperatures frequently predispose or contribute to development of this condition known as ick within the fish. This is due to Ichthyopterius multifilius. This is just a histological section of the skin of a channel catfish infected with the parasite. And here you see it localized within a cavity within the epidermis. There's hyperplate, marked hyperplasia around the parasite itself. Another histological section just to demonstrate the organism. This is, organism can vary anywhere from 250 to 350 microns in size and typically presents with a horseshoe shaped nucleus. I had alluded to earlier that this parasite also has a propensity to affect the gills, and essentially these are foci of infarction in the gill itself, essentially the, the parasite. This is a histological section of a channel catfish infected with it, and it's just to demonstrate the parasite itself is localized within the gill lamellae, interdigitated between two adjacent secondary lamellae, and you might be able to appreciate this hypoplastic epithelium, respiratory epithelium, which encompasses the parasite itself. These parasites individually don't contribute that significant degree of morbidity within the fish. However, when you have a cumulative effect of eruption of these parasites through the epidermis, it can lead to quite profound homeostatic derangements within the fish, which likely contribute to morbidity and subsequent mortality. This is a skin scraping of a, from a channel catfish just to demonstrate this organism. And oftentimes, a presumptive diagnosis can be made. 
based on clinical presentation as well as just a skin scrape. And this just demonstrates that horseshoe-shaped nucleus and then this large parasite. And this is one of the largest protozoal agents that you'll actually discover or you, you may diagnose. This is a histological section of that fish. I don't know if you remember from that first talk that moribund fish that was swimming on the water surface that had a, a mycotic dermatitis and I would mentioned that you can get a number of different protozoal parasites within the gills. This is just to demonstrate there's about four or five different species there of these different types of parasites. From a management perspective, it's really important to distinguish whether these are going to have a direct infection or a direct life cycle and that they're capable of undergoing binary division on the host itself or whether it's something like um, ink where there's a phase that may be off the phase, off the fish within the environment. Important to distinguish because a single treatment or one to two treatments may be um, efficacious in terms of controlling this parasite infection, whereas something like ick, it will require persistent treatment, say every three days or every other day for a couple of weeks in order to control that disease process. Other ectoparasites that you may encounter, this is um, a leech that's found off of a fish. And these are of interest from a pathologic perspective because they're vectors to blood parasites in fish. They're Fish are also capable of being infected with trypanosomes and cryptobia and can potentially contribute to some degree of morbidity within very young stocks. So this is a hyrodynia and just important to appreciate that it is a potential vector of blood parasite. Are there any questions at all? This is coming into a tropical fish entity. This is a disease which affects fish within aquarium facilities, but also for the tropical fish obvious, and can have very devastating effects. From a normal anatomic perspective, along the flank of the animal, there's a lateral canal, the lateral line. This is essentially a canal that's found in subcutaneous tissue, and the scales overlying the canal have, are punctuated by small, discrete holes, which allow free exchange of water into the canal. And the canal itself is very highly innovative. So essentially, it can perceive any sort of motion within the environment, as well as a number of different um, types of inputs, and then um, for flight, flight responses and so on. This lateral line actually extends rostrally or cranially, and then rostrally, it arborizes over the, um, the cranium of the fish. The disease that I'm referring to is actually called hole in the head disease. And here you can appreciate along the lateral flank this um, erosive condition. It's multifocal and coalescing and quite extensively involving this whole area. Unfortunately, we don't really understand the pathogenesis of this condition, nor the etiology. There's been a recent paper published where they've identified and isolated a real virus within the spleen of these fish. However, subsequent exposure trials were unsuccessful in terms of trying to transmit the disease. There have been a number of protozoal parasites, hexamina, that have been postulated, as well as metazoan parasites, certain trematodes. There are primary bacterial infections. At one time, some people have postulated of mycobacteriosis, and as well as environmental problems. There have been some uh, um, people who have alluded to a possible interaction with copper in terms of possibly contributing. Unfortunately, it seems to be a very complex, multifactorial type phenomenon. I should also mention another key feature is possibly nutrition. Last aquarium fish, this is an angelfish that presents with these small subdermal or uh, dermal cavities. These can erupt and coalesce. They're frequently bound by a thin margin of hyperemia. They could be locally extensive, quite extensive, involving the entire rostrum. Aesthetically, these could be of considerable significance. This was an entity that was worked up by Dr. Mark Steder up at the um, Wildlife Conservation Center in New York, and it's actually due to fusarium infection. So it's just another consideration in terms of some of the differentials that you might want to come up with with these ulcerative and erosive conditions in fish. This is just a photomicrographic physiologic data. Other additional, um, less commonly encountered conditions, these are turbot that are farmed quite com uh, commercially off in Scotland as well as in France. And there are depigmented areas. This is actually due to a free fatty acid deficiency in the diet very unusual presentation. It's actually been used as an economic or a marketing scheme by the producers, and it seems to have been quite successful in terms of trying to get the product to the consumer. Another entity, this is predation. 
Here you can see the, the strike marks of birds associated with on the, the dorsal aspect of the salmonid. These can have quite a profound effect in terms of um, causing a blemish, as well as contributing to frank mortality or production loss. Just another example of predation along within a, a catfish. That entity of sunburn that I had described earlier, it's along, extending along the dorsum of this particular fish. You see the blanched areas. Next disease we're going to get into or touch on is uh, granulomatous processes. By their very nature, due to the chronicity, it tends to occur primarily in older class stocks. Typically, there are variable numbers of fish that are affected. This is probably something to do with the susceptibility, the inherent susceptibility of different individual fish within a given population. And you can find that there's actually a quite a profound temperature-dependent host response in terms of the manifestation of the appearance of these lesions. We can have anemia, exophthalmia. Exophthalmia is typically secondary to renal involvement and disruption of normal renal homeostasis. Peritonitis, and it's not unusual to get visceral adhesions or pseudodiptorinic membranes, as I had mentioned earlier in the uh, subacute phases of this disease process, subacute progressing onto chronic diseases. The gross presentation can vary in terms of its appearance. They can be white associated with just fibrous encapsulation or black due to melanin de deposition. This is typically associated with certain digenetic trematodes that infect the skeletal musculature of fish and give rise to a disease known as black spot disease. Typically they can caseate and it's not unusual for these fish to be debilitated and acquire secondary opportunistic infections. The histopathology, the granulominous, the, the discrete granulomas that you can appreciate microscopically within these fish is very reminiscent to what you find within higher vertebrates. You have the lymphocytes, histiocytes, the epithelioid cells, the um, collagen infiltrate. One of the distinguishing features is the um, accumulation of melanomacrophages, which infiltrate along the margins of the granuloma itself. It's really quite a profound effect, and I have some examples of that coming up. You can try and assess the nature of the pathogen associated with it, just based on the inflammatory infiltrate. And some of the differentials that you might think about would be bacterial, mycotic agents, um, parasites, as well as neoplasias. This is a fish, again, infected with bacterial kidney disease. This is a somewhat more chronic stage than that, the hemorrhagic blotty liver that I had shown to, to you earlier in the septicemic phase. Here, what you appreciate immediately below the capsule and randomly throughout the parenchyma are these small to intermediate sized areas of caseous necrosis and uh, granulomatous infiltrate. Appreciate the gills here. You see how bland they are? This is very typical of anemia within fish. And then the pyloric CT. This one does have a degree of um, adipose tissue interspersed within the visceral fat. This is a fish that has multi-systemic involvement with bacterial kidney disease. These slides are contributed by Dr. Rob Armstrong. And what you can appreciate is that same hepatic involvement. Here's the heart, but there's also visceral involvement, the spleen, there are small punctate foci throughout the splenic stroma, as well as the anterior and posterior kidneys. This area here, immediately below the kidney, is actually the swim bladder, which is used for buoyancy within these fish. Bacterial kidney disease, as I had mentioned earlier, has a propensity for the kidney, and it's probably associated with that fixed mononuclear phagocytic system. This is a focal involvement within the posterior kidney of Salmonid. This can be somewhat more locally extensive within the posterior kidney. You can have, they can undergo casein necrosis centrally. You can have multifocal to coalescing involvement virtually the entire kidney. Please note that within the channel catfish, you'll remember that there was an anterior, a discrete anterior kidney, and then a swim bladder, and then the posterior. Here, the, the anterior posterior kidneys actually merge with one another, and they're continuous. And then in a more severely affected um, Pacific salmon, here you just have a very profound hypoplastic interstitium and these very tense transverse um, bands that extend across the peritoneum overlying the, the kidney. One interesting phenomenon with bacterial kidney disease, and not unusual presentation, is a pericarditis or an epicarditis, which can have very profound effects in fish. Fish typically respond or increase cardiac output, not necessarily by stroke volume, but rather, I'm sorry, not by necessarily increasing heart rate, but rather by stroke volume. So by having a constricted pericarditis, this can actually have quite severe consequences for the fish themselves. 
This one you can see the swim bladder is quite distended and that would be a more normal presentation. Typically the bacteria will localize, you have hematogenous dissemination and then you get these septic thrombi that localize within the epaxial and hypaxial skeletal musculature just represented by these areas of hemorrhage. Oh, I'm sorry, one other thing I should um, emphasize here. This is a relatively subacute phase, acute to subacute, and you can see that the kidneys are very discrete margins, they're angulated and they're dark black very fairly normal appearing kidneys. This is just a cross section of a torso of a salmonid, and here you have the old ovaries. This next slide, oh, I'm sorry, this next slide actually demonstrates this cavitating myositis and the subdermal, um, subdermal cavities as well as muscular cavities. You can see where the kidneys themselves are markedly enlarged with these rounded margins. Essentially, they're very hyperplastic. Fish will come in in the initial phases of the inflammatory response will evoke quite a profound infiltrate um, of neutrophils and so on, neutrophils and macrophages. These will liberate their enzymes and cause, uh, degrade, hopefully not only, the, hope will degrade the pathogen as well as normal host tissue. The fish themselves are capable, or the skeletal musculature is capable of undergoing um, mitotic, undergoing mitosis and actually renewing. However, a fish that this extensively involved likely wouldn't ever recover. The histologic presentation, this is a uh, slide of the posterior kidney of a Pacific salmon that's infected with bacterial kidney disease. We've used an immunoperoxidase, which is, has a monoclonal that's recognizing a P57 antigen, which is considered the prime virulence factor for bacterial kidney disease. The really interesting thing about this disease is just to appreciate that within Pacific salmon, we tend to have just sheets of histiocytes. There's no organization, there's no, or very little um, accumulation of collagen fibers within this matrix. Whereas within Atlantic salmon, what you start to appreciate centrally, this, these, this is the immunoperoxidase stain and the brown precipitate is the antigen that's being localized within these granulomas. You have a thin to moderately thick collagen capsule and then the, the histiocytic infiltrate and then you start to see these melanomacrophages infiltrating around the areas. And you find that there is actually quite a profound difference in terms of their susceptibility to infections, and the Atlantic salmon appear to have a more profound cell-mediated inflammatory response relative to the uh, Pacific salmon. Just an interesting interspecies variation. Just another photograph showing these granulomas within the fish. These animals, the Atlantic salmon, are actually capable of generating multinucleated giant cells, and it's not unusual with certain fungal infections to actually localize fungal hyphae within these different entities. Just as an aside, this was bacterial kidney disease within um, Pacific salmon. And these individuals, I'm sorry, this is bacterial kidney disease within Atlantic salmon. And what they develop is a crescentic glomerular nephritis, which is an entity recognized in young children with rapidly progressive post rectococcal infections, as well as in certain species of sheep, like Finnish landry sheep, which have um, a hypocomplement anemia where they can't solubilize any of the immune complexes that lodge in the basement membranes of the glomeruli. Just another photograph to demonstrate a different perspective. One of the differentials, of course, would have to be an accumulation of histocytes within those um, glomerular tufts. And what we did, uh, as Dr. Moeller had demonstrated some, or I'm sorry, Dr. Ed Noga had demonstrated some time ago, that fish cytokeratins, or at least the cytokeratins as a group, seem to be highly conserved phylogenetically. And we can actually exploit that and use monoclonals against cytokeratin in order to demonstrate that these cells are actually of epithelial origin. And as you're probably well aware, these fish, their epithelioid cells, the macrophages differentiating into epithelial cells, actually acquire desmosomes and tonofilaments, and they become almost epithelial-like rather than being necessarily epithelioid-type cells. And that's just to, control, to demonstrate the staining. As I had alluded to earlier, they, this is one of the few currently known bacterial diseases which is vertically transmitted within fish. And we found that fish is, as short as um, 10 centimeters were actually getting intra ovum localization of the bacteria. And here you find within the ovigerous lamellae interspersed just florid accumulation of the bacteria itself. This bacteria can re be readily demonstrated with a PAS stain. It's the magenta colored organisms here. And you can actually see them being um, recruited into the follicular cells, which we hypothesize actually
facilitates intraoval infection. Unfortunately, a fish are acquiring infection when they're only four and a half to six grams or four to six grams. It would be extremely difficult from a management perspective to try and control that disease simply because infection is probably already well established. This is a histological section of the posterior kidney of a fish. This is a Pacific salmon that was infected with bacterial kidney disease. And it's just to demonstrate that in addition, or you have this renal interstitial hyperplasia. It's a fairly heterogeneous population, although it's predominantly lymphomyeloid. But you have expansion of the interstitium. There's displacement of the renal tubules. It's displacement and compression. Important to distinguish this entity from the next disease, which is lymphoma. This is a pike lymphoma. And essentially here, you have a, a monomorphic population of cells that are typical um, anatom or they're very typical to what you would see with uh, lymphocyte or lymphomas within higher vertebrates. This is one of the first diseases within fish that was actually identified as due to a retrovirus infection. It's just referred to as pike lymphoma virus. Here you can see the high mitotic activity associated with it. Just a gross photograph of a pike affected with the disease itself. Another differential, when you're presented with granulomas in the kidney of a fish, this is a somewhat more subtle change, but here you see that there are a linear array of multifocal to occasionally coalescing, what appear to be granulomas. This is a fish, the next one, um, a salmonid that seems to be somewhat more severely affected. These slides are um, kindly provided by Dr. Ron Armstrong, but here you actually have a secondary hydroureter associated with it. You can see how pronounced the the ducts are and these interluminal dis deposits. This is actually fish uh, nephrocalcinosis. From an epidemiologic perspective, this is a disease that has been associated with carbon dioxide levels greater than 12 parts per million within aquaculture facilities. And typically, you can find this in groundwater supplied hatchery facilities. And essentially, histologically, what you can appreciate are these intratubular deposits with expansion of the renal tubules and frequently disruption of the tubular epithelium. I don't have any good examples of it, but if this does extend into the interstitium of the kidney, it can actually evoke quite a profound granulominous infiltrate. In addition to the kidneys, it's not unusual to find it within the wall of the stomach as well. Another entity, this is something that we find extremely commonly within aquarium fish, all too commonly, unfortunately, here you have these large areas of casein necrosis within the kidney. You might see remnants of the renal tumor. Essentially, it's effaced virtually the entire interstitium. This is mycobacteriosis. Three major common ones, at least um, based on that, my experience, have been mycobacterium colonia abscessus has been number one, and then fortuitum, mycobacterium fortuitum, and then mycobacterium marinum. And here, this is an acid fast stain just to demonstrate or the organisms within these large areas of necrosis. A note of caution, you can find these cavitating granulomas within the renal interstitium, but I've also seen this present just as the few sheets of histiocytes, almost like a histiocytic sarcoma. So in fish, and especially in fish, but we've also found it within amphibians and certain reptiles, whenever you see a histiocytic infiltrate like that, you want to at least consider putting on an acid fast. In addition, we found that just um, based on empirical data that we stained with the Z or Zils Nielsen versus the, um, the fight Faraco, and we found that the fight actually demonstrated the organism somewhat more frequently than the typical, um, the usual ZN stain that we would use. This is just a radiograph of a fish that's infected with mycobacterium just to demonstrate you have a loss of abdominal detail. These are more slides from Dr. Stetter. Here you have immediately below the liver capsule these extensive accumulation of granulomas as well as within the around the pericardium. One differential that we find very commonly within fish that are maintained within aquarium systems is a, um, gran a, yolk, sac or a yolk peritonitis. For some reason, there's some either environmental trigger or a physiologic trigger which is absent with these fish and they don't seem to ovulate. They have rupture of the eggs could also be attributed with um, trauma, and it seems to evoke quite a profound granulomatous infiltrate. Not necessarily this picture, but you know when you see diffuse uh, fibrosing peritonitis, that would be a, a one prime consideration. The next photograph actually 
Oh, this is just the growth picture of the liver as it's been removed from the fish. This mycobacteriosis is a very important disease. One thing that might be confused for a granuloma, a granuloma within fish, this is actually a normal anatomic feature. This is a corpuscles of stannous within the kidney. In salmonids, this is a section of the posterior kidney of a salmon. You can see that this is immediately below the peritoneum and it protrudes up above the surface of the kidney. And it's not unusual for novice fish pathologists to consider this either as a granuloma or a neoplastic process. Just an entity to recognize as being a normal feature of fish. This is another slide um, demonstrating a possible differential for kidney granulomas. This is unfortunately out of focus, but here is the swim bladder. It's a situated immediately below the kidney. This is a sagittal section of a very small rainbow trout. Within the swim bladder itself, oh, I'm sorry. From a, a comparative perspective, the swim bladder is a structure that communicates with the dorsal aspect of the esophagus. In some fish, this is its patent. These are known as physostomes. And in other fish, it's not patent. And these are known as physoclists. The physostomes, the ones that have a patent communication between the esophagus and the swim bladder, are very prone to um, fungal infections. Essentially what happens is they aspirate infective spores which localize within the lumen of the swim bladder and then can evoke quite a profound inflammatory response. The prime two that you would think about are foma and phyllophora. These essentially localize in and they evoke this fibrosing response. Essentially there's fairly profound neural um, thickening and there's a lot of fibrosis and you may be able to appreciate these mycotic elements within the vessels. Other things that might evoke or rep mimic a granulomatous response, these are co renal coccidia. This is from a cod off the west coast of Canada. This is a, a species that, or this is an organism that hadn't yet been speciated and are currently working on. It's just to, for you to, it's not necessarily for you to memorize the individual, or I hope that you don't memorize individual species, but just appreciate that there are a number of different diseases that can occur within different groups and different organs within fish. This is a protozoal parasite that you would typically find within the gills or nasal pits and occasionally on the skin of fish. This is trichodina and it's essentially located within these large um, ducts within the kidney. Very unusual presentation. It's from a medaca. And then Steospora. This is from a rainbow trout. You might be able to appreciate within the lumen some of these small mixosporidium parasites. One of the parasites which I don't have a good photograph of is proliferative, gild or proliferative kidney disease. This is a, another mixosporidium that can cause very devastating losses in very young fish. I had mentioned before about a yolk peritonitis. This is actually lactobacillus infection in salmonids and rainbow trout. This is one of the pyloric ceci, one of those blind ending diverticuli off the, the duodenum or caudal limit of the stomach. And you can actually appreciate this morphologically. They have a stratum compactum, which is convoluted structure around the margin here. And then here, there's a very thick uh, component of granulomatous infiltrate along the surface. This is due to associated with stripping of rainbow trout. These fish aren't, um, they can actually go undergo successive spawning cycles on an annual basis. And rather than actually stripping them where they incise the abdomen, they're actually able to express the eggs out through the, um, around the, the vent and inadvertently through tra trauma, they can actually evoke this condition. Another entity which causes a granulomatous infiltrate within the, within the peritoneum is visceral granuloma. This is something that was initially recognized within hybrid striped bass associated with feeding of gossypol. And essentially, this is the uh, part of that pyloric CT and adjacent to it, you have a fat lobule and then you, can, you may be able to appreciate the pancreatic acid cells. And then within this fat lobule, you'll start to appreciate, you can discern these um, granulomas, which essentially consist of concentric layers of fibrous tissue and then a central area of necrotic eosinophilic debris. These can be multifocal and, and coalescent. Another differential, this is a pleurocircoid of diphilobothrium, potential zoonotic agent. Essentially, it's a very typical feature of an immature tapeworm and it's got a thick fibrous capsule. Just another differential for a granulomatous infiltrate. 
Another one, this one you can actually visualize grossly if you examine the mesentery of fish quite closely, particularly in the cranial limit of the, the, ab of the abdominal cavity. And these grossly appear as creamy to white uh, firm capsules. This is a, a Brockman body. It's essentially a large islets of Langerhan, a normal anatomic feature of fish, just something to keep in the back of your mind. Other differentials for granulominous processes within fish, this is within the liver, essentially the entire parenchyma is effaced by these areas of um, infiltrate. This is due to Serratomyxa shasta. I've included this one because it's one of these interesting parasites which help to formulate an idea or help to formulate the hypothesis of using parasites as natural tags for fish. So essentially they can determine the watershed origin of certain strains of fish depending on the parasite burden that might be present. This is just a section of the liver and you see that the sinusoids are expanded or the hepatic cords are virtually obliterated by accumulation of these parasites. Nobody really understands their life cycle or pathogenesis of the condition. Another differential is ichthyophonus. This is a haplosporidium parasite. There's been some debate. It's fluctuated between being a fungus versus a protozoa, and I believe it is currently classified as a protozoal agent. This one is one of those diseases that is frequently associated with feeding of trash fish or consumption of some of the scavenger fish, which may be infected and um, can have very devastating effects on production stocks. This is within salmonids. Anisacus infections immediately below the liver capsule. One, another one I had mentioned earlier, this is from a salmonid off the, or the Pacific salmon off the west coast of Canada, and I include it because it results in a degree of hepatomegaly, but what you can appreciate um, microscopically, this is a section of the liver of a Pacific salmon. There's marked pleomorphism, the, the size of the shell and shape of the hepatocytes is markedly variable. Um, if you examine these on slightly higher magnification, you can see these pseudo-inclusions as well as multinucleate itself. This was an entity that was recognized by Dr. Michael Canton's further characterized as being due to microcystin toxicity. Another differential, these are those mycotic thrombi that we know invaded the skin. This was actually from a spawning uh, pink salmon off the west coast of Canada, and we actually found these uh, mycotic thrombi localizing within the liver. Very interesting and unusual presentation. Are there any questions or anything need clarification? This next disease is a disease which has emerged over the last five to 10 years within Mississippi and has been found virtually anywhere channel catfish have been harvested. It was characterized in California as well. It's known as hamburger gill disease or proliferative gill disease. It's due to a protozoal parasite, a mixosporidium known as aranthinum mixon. It has an intermediate host at dural worm, which is found within the substrate. And from an epidemiologic perspective, it's found that you get a massive proliferation of these worms and then very shortly thereafter, um, the orantinum mixon will start to be liberated within the water and fish will start presenting clinically. This is a uh, channel catfish. We have removal of the operculum. And it, essentially, it's referred to as hamburger gill disease because there's the, the gills look like mush. This was a, a fish that was retrieved from a pond, was actively swimming, but essentially was frank necrosis, fracture of the primary lamellae. From a uh, clinical perspective, this is what we call a gill wet mount, where you remove a couple of the gill filaments and place them on a drop of water. And you, we can examine these from channel catfish, and these areas that are loosened here are discontinuous, they're multifocal. This is areas that are affected, and this would be at least very, make us very suspicious of proliferative gill disease. This is, so we can diagnose this entity just based on gill wet mounts. Again, just a normal histological section of a gill. This is a very early stage of the disease which typified by two fairly discrete entities. There's one here where you get a very small focus of granulominous infiltrate, as well as another entity here of chondrodysplasia. Here you have marked variability in the size and shape of the chondrocytes. People have said this is pathognomic for back proliferative gill disease, but I've come across a couple of other diseases not associated with proliferative gill disease where there is fairly marked chondrodysplasia. This is a fish that's somewhat more severely affected. Here you find that it's more segmental. 
and there are multiple gill filaments that are currently being affected. You'll notice where there's expansion of the primary lamellae, there's marked interlamellar epithelial hyperplasia, which obliterates these functional exchange units within the gills. And then it can even become somewhat more extensive. Here, there's that granulomatous infiltrate. There's fracture, disruption of the normal cartilaginous support structure here. And um, you may be able to appreciate the parasites themselves. Frequently, they're demarcated by a, a, a margin of epithelioid cells, which is something we try to encapsulate them. These, you can see that there's a fairly marked expansion of the chondrocyte or the cartilage within the primary lamellae here. One of the things that we were able to find when just through looking at very severely affected fish, this was one that was from the posterior kidney of a channel catfish. You can see a remnant of a renal tubule. There's a degree of granulomatous infiltrate within the interstitium. And then you can localize these parasitic um, agents within the peritubular sinusoids. We even actually found the parasite within these tubules and then within the lumen of the tubule, even a smaller component. So right now, the life cycle of this parasite hasn't been fully discerned. People are doing a lot of studies with corticosteroid implants to try and um, facilitate proliferation of the parasite and perhaps try and further resolve its life cycle. Very, very commercially important disease within the channel catfish industry. Hepatomas. This is um, frequently in areas of environment, uh, industrially, the areas of heavy industrial environmental impact. Here, just, just massive expansion of the, of the liver within a freshwater eel. Similarly, within livers from flatfish, there have been fairly a number of studies done initially in the early 70s along the west coast of Washington state, as well as throughout North America and Europe, demonstrating incidence of hepato, um, hepatocellular carcinomas as high as 300 times in fish uh, relative to areas, say, 30 miles away, where it would have a very low incidence. Very typical histological presentation. Some more uh, spontaneous neoplasias that you may come across. This is just an osteoma. This is a slide that was provided by Dr. Gary Wobus here up in Saskatoon. Another interesting entity, which nobody really understands the pathogenesis to, this is walleye myopathy. This is a, um, essentially a granulomatous myositis or granulomatous um, myopathy that's recognized within these fish. That was just a, a gross photograph. You can appreciate these areas of necrosis and um, fibrous infiltrate. Subgross photograph, you can see that it's quite segmental in its distribution within individual use. So it would lead you to at least be suspicious of a possible vascular or neurogenic phenomenon. But nobody really understands the present the pathogenesis. And just a higher magnified, uh, higher power photomicrograph of the affected areas where you get these concentric layers of collagen fibers that entrap skeletal muscle fibers. This is that red spot disease I had mentioned earlier with channel catfish where you tend to see these multifocal areas of what is just frank necrosis of the uh, skeletal musculature within channel catfish. We believe this is associated with elevated levels of lactic acid. The fish are essentially maintained in overcrowded situations with very low levels of oxygen and they're unable to um, regulate that way. Very important disease. Another differential that you might come across, this is from a salmonid. It's not unusual to have um, electrical storms and lightning will strike these fish or um, one of the anesthetic methods that have been recently developed recently developed has been with um, using electro anesthesia where they insert probes in the water and if the charges or the voltage is too high essentially what happens is you get a very profound contracture of the skeletal musculature which can fracture the vertebral column which is what's happened in this individual fish. This is just a, a slice demonstrating where it's uh, involvement of the distal limit beyond this area here quite segmental. And we've seen cases like this within rainbow trout farms where there's been um, stray electricity entering into ponds and possibly contributing to this type of problem. Black spot disease, just to demonstrate the gross presentation of this due to a diagenetic trematode. Actually, there are uh, multiple trematodes that have been associated with this disease. It's just an entity that should be recognized. It's not unusual to find it within ongoing phases uh, of production cycles for salmonids where the um, nets are inadvertently introduced to an area where there are a large number of intermediate hosts which facilitate recruitment. Just a slightly higher power magnification. 